Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the regulatory section of the hybrid meeting of the Planning and Regulatory Services Committee. Can I ask everyone to please mute their microphones at all times, unless invited to speak by myself. For those of you who are physically in the council chamber, can I ask, can I please remind you that when speaking into your microphone, you need to wait until you see yourself on the screen so the live feed can pick up your comments. If you speak before your image is projected, those listening on the live feed or via Zoom may not be able to hear you say anything. This is obviously particularly important in the case of a vote being required. Audio recording is being used to assist in preparing the formal minutes. Therefore, anyone participating in the meeting consents to it being recorded and being live streamed on YouTube. Okay, members moving on to agenda item one. Apologies. At the minute, I don't have any, <coughs> have any from the floor. Councillor Lavery. Well, thanks, Sharon. No, just to say, um, I think a couple of us might be heading to a vigil at six, so we might be leaving the meeting a bit early, but I'm hoping to return after that, just, you know, when, when the plan section comes in. Thanks. Julie noted, Council Lavery, I think there's a few of you going. Um, I was made aware of it by the Council officers. Um, so there's no real other apologies. Agenda item two, deck based of interest. Again, take them now or as we come across them during the meeting. Yep. Um, move on to agenda item three, report from the head of planning. Um, and we have two items for information. 3.3, overview of the report from the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman on tree protection. And I'm going to bring in Helen Stoops, heading over to my right. It's the right one. Yeah. Yeah, there you go, Helen. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Uh, the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman wrote to the Department for Infrastructure and All Councils in July 2022, advising that concerns had been raised with her office regarding how public bodies fulfil their duties to protect trees within the planning system. As a result, the Ombudsman carried out an own initiative investigation and invited public bodies to submit comments and details in response to a number of set questions. The Ombudsman has confirmed that she does not wish to proceed to a full investigation at this stage. However, the information gathered has resulted in a series of observations and recommendations, which are set out in the Ombudsman report entitled Strengthening Our Roots, which can be found at Appendix 1. The report is primarily structured around six sections, including strategies, policies and procedures, tree preservation orders, applications for works to protect the trees, protected trees on council-owned land, statutory undertakers and enforcement activity. Overall, there are a total of 26 recommendations within the report, seven of which are solely for DFI to address, whilst three encourage councils and DFI to work jointly together. The remaining recommendations relate solely to councils, our council is already in the process of implementing a number of these recommendations relating to tree preservation orders and enforcement activity. In relation to a way forward, officers propose to engage with internal and external partners to consider the recommendations of the report and opportunities for working jointly on their implementation. The purpose of this paper is to make members aware of the NIPSO publication Progress reports will be provided to members in due course, along with details of any associated resource and or financial implications that may arise. Members, this item is for noting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Alan. Members, I know it's for noting. Happy for any questions or comments to make. No, okay, move on. Thank you very much, Alan. Move on to 3.2 update on the planning application caseloads. I'm going to bring in Roisin Hamill, Principal Planning Officer, to present the item. Over to you, Roisin, please. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. The purpose of this report is to update members in relation to current planning caseloads. And as set out in detail in the report, the Department issued 137 decisions in the period the 24th of October to the 28th of November. A total of 173 applications were received in the same period, which is high, but not unexpected at this time of year. 
The overall caseload has increased slightly and currently sits at 1,054. And as set out, there was one call in request received during the same period. Um, thank you, members. This item is for noting, but I'm happy to take any questions. <coughs> Thank you very much, Roisin. Again, members, any comments or questions? No. Thank you, members. Thank you, Roisin. I'll move on to agenda item four, report from the head of building control. We have three items for decision, 4.1 to 4.3. I'm going to bring in Mr. Tom Lavery here to, regarding 4.1 street naming report for Dawson's and Lennon Fields. Okay. Tom, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, item 4.1, this is a slightly unusual one, and that's a request for the naming of two housing developments consisting uh, of 25 dwellings of Charles Street in Portadown and 40 dwellings of uh, Montague Street in Portadown. And the applicant, as members can see in the report, uh, has stated in the first paragraph of the letter that whilst there's no through road, there is a pedestrian access uh, between the two sites, and therefore highlighting the need for the development names to be linked. So consequently, both reports are both names proposals are within this one report. Maps, etc., are within Appendix One. The um the applicant's preferred name for the development of Charles Street is a Dawson's Domain, and the applicant's main reason for the preferred name is that this is based on the history of the area related to the Dawson family, who were the leading linen family in the area. The applicant has subsequently proposed names for the development of uh, Montague Street, and the again the applicant's preferred name for this development is Linen Fields. And the applicant's main reason for the preferred name is that it would uh, propose to link the meaning behind both developments and retain the linen reference, which was historic in the, uh, in the use of this area. Members are asked to note that the name Linen Fields already exists for development of the Huntley Road and Bam Bridge, and also a development of the Tandagee Road in Lurgan. Uh, under item 3.2 of the street naming and numbering policy, it does state, and uh, to avoid confusion over addresses, the name should not sound sim similar to an existing street or road name within the locality. However, uh, there should be no confusion. Uh, officers believe with this uh, proposal as the, de the development is 9.8 miles away from the Bam Bridge development and 6.7 miles away from the Lurgan development. Officers therefore have assessed and deemed that the proposals are compliant with the Council's street naming policy and would recommend approval of the name suggested. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Tom. Members, balls in your court. For any questions or concerns or queries? Councillor Duffy, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Ed, no queries, no concerns at all. The map looks slightly different now. I only live a short distance from that area, and I'd be happy to propose. Thank you very much, Councillor Duffy. Any other questions or queries? Count Alderman Wilson, are you happy to second? Second by Alderman Wilson. We all agreed? <coughs> all great. Thank you very much, members. Move on to 4.2. Street naming report for Foxwood Green. And again, it's Tom to present the report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a request for the naming of two housing developments consisting of 60 dwellings off Foxwood Hall on the Belfast Road in Lurgan, and details are in Appendix 2. The applicant's preferred name for this development is Foxwood Green, and the applicant's main reason for the preferred name is uh, due to being a continuation of the established Foxwood housing development. The recommendation, therefore, is for members' approval of Foxwood Green for this development. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. And again, thank you, Tom. Members, balls in your court. Councillor Duffy. Just happy to propose, Chair, recommendation. Thank you very much, Councillor Duffy. Okay, the David has just jumped in oh, literally God. before you. Um, so proposed by Councillor Duffy and second by... <laughs> Alderman uh, Deputy Chair, we all agreed? Great, thank you very much, members. I'll move on to 4.3, um, discussion document and pre-consultation, -consult the way forward for energy efficiency. And again, I'm going to bring in Tom to present the report. Over to you, Tom. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of this report is to seek members' approval to uh, submit the attached draft response at Appendix 3 to a current consultation document or discussion document, which is Appendix 4. This has been issued by the Department of Finance, uh, a building standards branch, known uh, more locally as BSB, who are responsible for setting legal requirements contained within the building regulations in Northern Ireland. This is a pre-consultation exercise by BSB, and they're seeking feedback on a review of the energy efficiency requirements um, to various related aspects of the building regulations. And basically, the consultation will be used to inform our future proposals on the uplift of building regulations, particularly relating to conservation of fuel and power in both dwellings and buildings other than dwellings. It covers uh, the document covers um, uh, potential next steps and has a wide range of interrelated areas, including conservation of fuel and power, as well as ventilation, as well as uh, mitigation of overheating in dwellings, and also electric vehicle charging infrastructure um, in car parking spaces. This uh, is referred to as a discussion document. It represents basically a call for evidence on a pre-consultation format uh, covering a wide range of subjects. Um, and in addition to 273 pages, uh, there are 125 questions, so it's quite a comprehensive document. Given the extent of the areas covered, the BSB also arranged for a series of seven online uh, webinar events, uh, which is unusual, uh, but it was very useful uh, for all stakeholders, and that won't happen every week since the Wednesday, 30th of August. Officers have reviewed the documents, and comments are included in the consultation response uh, at Appendix 3. Uh, this draft response focuses mainly on the Council's direct building regulations enforcement function, but also takes into account all their comments from colleagues in planning department relating to proposals on electric vehicle charging infrastructure for market spaces. The proposed areas for consideration and um, considering changes are very wide ranging and far reaching in terms of carbon reduction and the current changes to uh, building practices in Northern Ireland. This will be the first in a series of uplifts in the coming years, which will take uh, buildings towards uh, zero carbon, which is to be welcomed. However, um, many aspects of the proposals would significantly affect the nature of development and construction in local building industry. It is anticipated that future uplifts to standards would mean the exclusion of oil boilers uh, from being installed in new buildings. The BSB anticipate that LPG fuel boilers or the use of heat pumps would provide alternative means of heating in this scenario. But these solutions would have additional capital and running cost implications uh, compared with the urban situations um, who don't have necessary access to mains gas. The proposed policy options would apply equally to both rural and urban areas. However, as referenced in the preliminary rural impact assessment at Appendix 5, rural buildings are more likely to be off gas grid and are traditionally more reliant on the carbon intensive fuels, notably oil, compared to urban buildings. Therefore, people in rural areas are more likely to be impacted from future uplifts to energy efficient standards. There are also likely to be impacts around electricity grid reinforcement as increased electrification of heat and the use of on-site renewables increases. Many of these proposals are such that the development will be dependent, at least in the short term, on the provision of a robust and widely available gas and electricity networks. However, it is widely acknowledged that neither of these are present throughout sizable areas of our borough. Whilst this issue sits outside the scope of the discussion document, every effort has been made in the draft response to highlight the importance of these issues. It is anticipated that while a further consultation um, accompanied by proposed regulations and technical guidance, etc., um, will be made prior to the implementation of these changes. The closing date for receipt of the responses has been extended by one month until the 15th of December. Thank you, Chair. This member, this report is from members' decisions. I'm happy to take any questions members may have. Thank you very much, Tom. Members, if you've had a look at the document, you'll see it's extremely comprehensive and fair play to the officers for going through it with a fine tooth comb. So I'm going to open open it up for Councillor Duffy to start off with. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I went through, I wouldn't say I've gone through it all, I've gone through a brave part of it anyhow. Uh, no, but there was, didn't seem to be any mention of if this was going to be implemented, would there be grants, would there be funding, not just the usual stuff. And if there wasn't, could we get something like that there in there, that there would have to be an extensive budget applied to these sort of works 
or grants, you know, from from the main government from Britain to actually bring these up to date because it's been basically a lack of money from the British government and infrastructure down through the years that sort of has has us behind, you know, in these sort of things. So they would need to sort of pay up if they want us to implement it. Thank you very much, Councillor Duffin. I'm going to bring in Tom, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, as a fair comment, um, all I can say is it doesn't mention anywhere about grants in, in any of this consultation, but it has been emphasized on, on umpteen times by officers in this council and other councils that this is highly dependent on, on infrastructure being there to make this work, both for the electric grid and for the gas grid and for whatever's coming down in the future of the gas grid. Um, that has been highlighted so many times and it's been acknowledged by the BSB that that is critical and by NAE and other stakeholders but there's no plan coming forward at this point in time as to how to address it. Just an acknowledgement that this is required. Go ahead, Councillor Duffy, let you back in. Yes, it would also have a big impact, you know, on a lot of local oil delivery firms. You know, there is an awful lot, you know, of independent ones and larger ones, you know, that would be, Severely affected by this, and all that would have to be taken into account too. Just I go back to a friend of mine telling him this is coming in, he's he wouldn't talk to me again. Thank you, Councillor Duffy and Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, I mean, it's such a huge area. Um, I think my big concern on it is you know, we we'll have this target. You know, it was debated at length. You had two bills in the assembly. It was, you know, you had this sort of, you know, departmental competition with private members' bills. It was, a, you know, the whole thing was a disaster from the start. And with, in my mind, we've ended up with much too ambitious targets to meet that'll really put our, you know, vulnerable people into even greater financial strain. And that hasn't really been taken into consideration at all. And, that's my worry where, you know, you have these targets without suitable incentives, you know, for people to make a jump, even, you know, the construction sector, you're going to be asking construction industry to pump millions more into their bills. And where's that going to be met? House prices, you know, these technologies are not cheap and they aren't the best suited to our climate either. And that's my big worry. And we're going to phase out oil, which is a really, you know, in a really well insulated house, it's a really super efficient way to heat your home. And, you know, we're chucking the baby out with the bathwater in many respects, pushing down this road for what 0.04% contribution to global emissions. When massive countries are, you know, continuing to build power stations, you know, Weekly, you might as well say, you know, that's my big concern, but that's a whole wider debate. You know, we have what we have in front of us, but I just think it's been ill thought out in many respects. And there's been very little thought given to, you know, the plethora of homes out there that aren't well insulated. It's going to be very difficult to retrofit insulation to them. And then you're going to be asking them to install maybe a heat pump or something that is just not going to work efficiently or be financially viable at all you know, into the future. So we need to really think about that. And I don't think, I don't even think the department has really thought about it, you know, and we're, you know, post RHI, we've threw the baby out with the bathwater too. We're handing back millions. We don't have a scheme with people who had genuinely bought in the RHI now selling them. Well, they can't sell it. It's just sitting gathering dust because nobody wants to touch it. So we have a whole melee to sort out in Northern Ireland in terms of renewables and we're nowhere near to doing it. So I would even expect changes to legislation, you know, that has been passed when, you know, people get a big slap of reality, you know, in terms of the government and in terms of officials when they realise this is just a nightmare and it's going to be very difficult and very expensive to meet these targets. It's just my personal view on it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alderman Wilson. Any other comments or questions? No. Members, it is uh, an item for decision. Can I get um, somebody to propose? Proposed by Councillor Lavery. 
in second by second by Councillor McGowan. Are we all agreed with the report? Okay, thank you very much, and thank you, Tom. Uh, move on to 4.4 and 4.5, which are two items for information. 4.4 is new dwelling stats, a uh, report from the Department of Finance, Land and Property Services, LPS. I'm going to bring in Tom to present this report. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is um, a good news story. Um, the LPS um, produced document and produced uh, quarterly statistics on the number of new dwellings throughout Northern Ireland. And the full report for each quarter from quarter one of 2005 right through to quarter three of, of this year can be viewed on the website as noted in the report. Notably, um, as Appendix 6 shows, um, an extract for Table 1.3, which is for new dwelling starts uh, for each council, that uh, from quarter one right through to quarter fifth, quarter three of this year, our council has been consistently in the top four councils uh, for the number of new dwellings being commenced. Um, with our council being the highest performing council in quarter two and quarter three of this year, and was the second highest performing council in quarter one of this year. Also notably, members will note that the uh, table 2.3, again, appendix six, uh, with, with regards to new dwelling completions, which equates to additional uh, rate space, uh, that our council has consistently been in the top three performing councils since 2015. Again, notably, our council has been the highest performing council in quarter two and quarter three, with it being the second highest performing council in quarter one of this year. Members, this report for information, but I'm happy to take any questions members may have. Thank you very much, Tom. Members, any questions? No. No. Tom, thank you very much. It is it is a very good news story. I'm just wondering, um, from the sort of the so what perspective, um, the reasoning behind this here. I wonder would you be able to link it with the likes of the comms and um, to see if we can get that out there. There's a good news story, you know, within the borough. We are basically punching well above our weight here and you know, in terms of this. And but do you think we should be shouting from it whenever we do get good news stories? If if they're agreement, then I think we should be posting that out. Do you all agreed with that? Thank you, members. Um, so move on to 4.5, update and building control and property certificate applications. And again, bring yourself in, Tom, please. Thank you, Chair. This is uh, just to keep members informed of the uh, workload undertaken by some of the workload undertaken by the department in the first eight months of this financial year. Um, noted in Appendix 7, we have received a total of 2,175 building regulation applications with a notional construction investment value of just over 130.2 million. Uh, for the, the the first eight months. We have carried out um, 9,558 site inspections and undertaken over uh, 1,300 plan assessments and issued all the relevant statutory approvals and notices. The department also continues to deliver the council's property certificate function for the convention of properties across the borough. In the last eight months, we've received and administered 2,189 new applications and issued 2,542 certificates to solicitors and agents relating to property sales. Again, Chair, this is for members' information, but I'm happy to take any questions members may have. And again, thank you very much, Tom. Members, any questions or queries? No. No. And thank you very much, Tom. Okay, I move on to agenda item five, conf confidential report. Can I seek a proposal and seconder to move the meeting into committee? Proposed by Councillor O'Dowd. And second by Councillor McGowan. Yeah, all agreed. Okay, thank you very much, members. Okay, members and online viewers, in accordance with Schedule 6 of the Local Government Act, we'll now be moving into confidential session of the Council. This means that we turn off the public feed of the meeting. This will be returned when the meeting is restarted. Can I ask ACT officers to please turn off the live feed and confirm the confidential session of the meeting can proceed?
start the live feed. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to agenda item seven, corresponds. Currently have none. Uh, agenda item eight, AOB, we don't have any. Okay, members, we're going to finish up for a wee while, go for a cup of tea to uh, 4 p.m. Yeah, thank you.
Uh, can I ask ACT to please start the lay feed? Thank you very much. Okay, I'll move on to agenda item six, applications for planning permission to be considered by the committee as per schedule of the planning applications. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the planning section of the hybrid meeting of the Planning and Regulatory Services Committee. Can I ask everyone to please mute their microphones at all times, unless invited to speak by myself. For those of you who are physically in the Council Chamber, can I remind you that when speaking into the microphone, you need to wait and see yourselves up on the screens. So the live feed can sp uh, pick up your comments. If you speak before your image is projected, those listening on the live feed or via Zoom may not be able to hear what you say. And this is obviously particularly important in the case of a vote being required. Audio recordings is being used to assist in preparing the formal minutes. Therefore, anyone participating in the meeting consents to it being recorded and being live streamed on YouTube. Also, during the course of this meeting, questions may be asked of councillors uh, who are members of the Planning and Regulatory Service Committee of Planning Officers, applicants for planning permission, objectors, or those speaking on their behalf. In doing so, councillors endeavour to ascertain the information which they feel is necessary to enable them to determine the application. However, members of the public should note that the councillors will not reach a conclusion as to whether an application should be approved refused or deferred until the debate on the application has concluded. Bit of a mouthful. Thank you very much, members, and thank you very much, members of the public. Okay, moving on to our first item for decision, Appendix 7, okay, application number LA08-2022-1544F, and it's an approval for the cornerstone. I'm going to bring in Roisin Hamill, Principal Planning Officer, to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. Roisin, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hamill. 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 Machine, there you are. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This application seeks full planning permission for the erection of a 20 metre telecommunications column and associated head frame, ancillary works, and cabinet on lands adjacent and northwest of 46 to 50 Lurgan Road, Portadown. Mm -hmm. The application is before you this evening based on the number of objections received. The application site is located within the development limits of Portadown, and the proposed column is to be located on a grass verge adjacent to the Lurgan Road in front of the Portadown campus of the SRC. To date, 11 letters of objection from seven postal addresses have been received, and officers' consideration of the matters raised have been detailed in the report circulated. As detailed in the report, the nearest residential properties to the application site are numbers 44 and 45 Beaumont Avenue, approximately 42 metres northwest, and one Hillside Crescent, which is 60 metres northeast. In terms of health impacts, the proposal was accompanied by an ICNIRP declaration of conformity. Regional guidance advises that where applications for the development of telecommunications equipment are accompanied by this declaration, it should not be necessary for the planning authority to consider health concerns any further. In terms of visual impact, officers are of the opinion that the mass will benefit from the backdrop of the SRC campus and the mature trees along the frontage of the verge will aid integration of the lower level of the mast. The use of grey galvanised finish for the mass will reduce the apparent scale of the proposal when set against the background of the SRC and the sky. Officers are satisfied that sufficient information has been submitted to comply with the requirements of TEL 1 of PPS 10 in terms of the need for the proposed development and the consideration of mass sharing and alternative sites. Officers are of the opinion that the proposal meets the policy requirements of policy TEL 1 of PPS 10 and the corresponding sections of the SPPS and recommend that members grant plan permission subject to the conditions set out in the report. And I'm happy to take you through the PowerPoint. And this is the location of the site within the general area. The, uh, the red arrow obviously is giving you an indication of where the application site is located to the south of the Glen Demplex and to the front of the SRC. And this is an aerial context of the site, just showing you the residential properties in the area, the Southern Regional College campus and the Glen Dimplex complex to the north. And this is the site location map that was submitted with the plan and application. And you can see the application site outlined in red there on the grass verge. And again, this is just a proposed site layout showing you where the cabinets to be located and the, the column itself. And these are the proposed elevations of the column. As you can see, it's a monopole with the equipment at top and it extends to 20 metres in total. 
And this is the first photograph of the site, just looking at, I don't know if you can see the white arrow there, just showing you the location of where the, the mast and the cabinet will be located on that grass verge. And this is just another view of the site on the approach from the north. Again, the white arrow gives you an indication of where it will be located. And this is a view of the site just from the entrance there to the Glen Dimplex uh, complex. Again, the white arrow gives you an indication of where it will be located. And the top photograph gives you an indication of the site um, when viewed from Beaumont Avenue. And the bottom is uh, another view of the site from the Lurgan Road when approaching from the south. Thank you, members. Thank you very much, Fushin. Um, okay, members, we have Mr. Johnny Buckley, MLA, to make re representation and objection to the application. We have Alderman Tinsley or Lord Murray to make representation and objection. Uh, Ms. Gillian Jess to make representation and objection. And Les Ross to make representation as the agent in support of the application. So, going to start off with Johnny Buckley, MLA. Johnny, you have five minutes. You're not a stranger to this committee, so you know the process at five minutes. You're cut off, okay? Um, so whenever you see yourself up on the screen, okay, it's over to yourself, okay, Johnny? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and indeed, thank you, members, for your time. I would like to thank the members for giving me the opportunity to address uh, you today on behalf of the concerned residents of this local Portadown community. Today, I come before you to express our collective concerns regarding the proposed 5G telecommunications column and associated ancillary works on the Lurgan Road. Firstly, let me acknowledge the importance of advancements in technology and the benefits that it can bring to our society. However, as responsible citizens, it is crucial for us to understand that these advancements are implemented with careful consideration for their impact on the immediate surroundings, a key material planning consideration. A primary concern I would like to emphasize on behalf of residents is the proposed location of the 5G telecommunications column. Placing such a structure in a residential area raises serious questions about the potential consequences for the health and well-being of residents. And I would urge members to look further than some of the slides that suggest, because this is quite a, a developed area in relation to residents living in harmony uh, for a long period of time with educational institutions such as Craig Avon Senior High and the SRC. While we understand the need for improved connectivity, we must also recognize the safety and comfort of the people who call this area home. The level of consultation with residents, we believe, has been poor, with neighbors feeling disregarded in the decision-making process. There is, without doubt, a wider impact on applications such as this, uh, MAST, and the process fails to take notice of these concerns. I would ask the committee, and in agreement with the Lord Mayor Margaret Tinsey, who will speak next, what other sites were considered. Furthermore, the devaluation of property is a legitimate concern that we believe has not been taken into due consideration in coming to this planning approval conclusion. Studies have shown that the installation of telecommunications infrastructure, particularly in, the, in close proximity to residential properties, can have a negative impact on property values. This is not merely a financial concern. It directly affects the livelihoods and investments of individuals and families in our community. Many of those that now live in this harmonious residential area have come to the area in recent years, saving hard for a home in which they felt adequately met their needs. Many have expressed the view to me that if they had known that this particular telecommunications column was to be installed in its proposed location, they would have not have bought their property. I would ask the committee to investigate what evidence has been provided to suggest that this would not devalue property. Additionally, I would urge the committee to consider the aesthetic uh, aspect of the proposed 5G column. This residential area has a unique character and it is essential that any development maintains the visual harmony and integrity of the locality. 
The appearance of the proposed structure, if not in keeping with the surrounding area and environment, could diminish the overall quality of life for residents. I would also like to draw members' attention to the fact that this is a very busy intersection in the wider Craig Avenue area with many people and families using it as a walk for recreational use and indeed school and further education use. In conclusion, we recognize the importance of progress and technological advancements. However, we must balance these advancements with the well-being and rights of the individuals who make up this residential community. I urge the committee to carefully consider the evidence and take on board these genuine planning considerations and reconsider this decision. Surely we can find an appropriate alternative location to cite this mass where it does not cause hardship to local ratepayers and communities. We all know of the continued uh, media attention there is towards 5G masts in different communities throughout not only Northern Ireland, but right across these islands. And I would say to members that I think we are doing a huge disservice to ratepayers if we cannot collectively, uh, with um, applicants' involvement, look towards alternative locations that do not have direct residential impact. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Johnny. And I'm going to move on to yourself, Alderman Tinsley. Okay, you know, you process yourself whenever you see the, the clock up on the screen there, just take it from there, which one are you? Okay, over to yourself, Alderman. It, face isn't on the screen yet, Chair. It's just... Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, members. And you may recall a few months ago, I, speak, I spoke on a previous application, um, not for this particular um, application, but for another one for an installation of a 5G mask on another site. And during that planning meeting, the agent spoke in favour of the location. And part of his reasoning was, and I quote, the policy directed masks away from residential properties and to look at commercial properties and therefore tried to stay away from residential sites for installation. Now, then there was a site meeting called and following that approval was made um, for the application because it was a better site as it was more industrial. The reference is 3.26 of the planning. Developing a new ground mask should only be considered when other options are not possible or where it represents a better environmental solution. In order to minimize the visual and environmental impact, the following should be considered. An ornate lamppost um, masks uh, located within a group of trees at a major traffic junction. Placing a mask near to similar structures will minimize contrasts so that the overall effect is not cluttered, for example, industrial, commercial, pylons and lampposts. Now, I'm asking members here today that based on that information, I do not understand how they can consider this to be an industrial area. Beside where this proposed mask is, is wanting to be placed, right beside them and I, I actually don't believe that, that those photographs are very um they're very distorted in a sense and I don't mean that to be that it's I'm, I'm saying it's deliberately but there is close proximity to houses there both on site on the side of them but also there's a brand new development facing where that proposed mask is going and there is one or two of those houses are actually directly looking into where that mask is going to be placed the mask is also being placed on the grounds of the SRC, where there is many, many students there on a daily basis. And literally a couple of yards up from that is the Craigavon Senior High School, where there's hundreds of students there. On either side of the road, there's a public bus stop. And just as my colleague here, Jonathan Buckley, MLA, has said, that it's a regularly used road where walkers, um, and it's, it's a very, very busy road there as well. So all I would ask is, first of all, I would request how many other sites were considered before they put this application in for this particular area here? And just with in keeping of the, the policy, um, how many of them were actually a commercial location? Um, and I'm not going to say uh, waste any more time because I know there's other ob uh, objectors wanting to speak, Chair, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Alderman Tennessee. And I'm going to bring in Gillian Jess. You're very much welcome. Uh, Gillian, you have 
three minutes to make representation. Okay, just take your time, take a big deep breath, and you're <laughs> it's over to yourself. I think this oh, next one over. Yep, go ahead. Um, I find the report factually incorrect and sometimes wrong. When the planning application went into the newspaper, it said, you know, uh, voice your objections to the planning office, but it didn't ask for substantial evidence for the objections. And many of the objections raised in their uh, report are just wiped away by no substantial evidence uh, submitted. The site history, history government training centre, this feels that the, the government owns this land, but it doesn't. It's owned by the SRC, as in the deeds provided by land registry. They're going to place masks against the SRC boundary. This is not so. The land registry maps show that the SRC boundary goes right down to the bus stop and right round again. So the mast is going on the SRC land. Resident, residential amenities. The housing near the mast is on Hillside Crescent. Definitely not. I live in Hillside Crescent, which is up the road. It's one Birchill Park, as on the front of their report. If you look at their map at the back, where is one Birchill Park? It's not there. Is the mask factually wrong? Is it too close? But the one hills, hill, one Birchill Park is so close, they've got their boundary on the edge of the Southern Regional College. The front fence joins their fence. They are only metres away from that mast and will be visually intrusive and not be unobstructive, so will not conform to PPS 10. Let's talk about health. Health is very important. The IARC classifies radio frequency electromagnetic fields as partially, possibly carcinogenic to humans. And, and I don't think that this um, chair should be uh, told that they shouldn't take health into consideration, that it is a planning issue. Um, you have, the buck stops with you, you decide about where these masks should go. And it may or may not have health implications, but down the line, if it is, is there possibly going to be dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer in the community. So caution needs to be added here. But they say they've gone to the health agency and the health agency says it complies with the guidelines and it's fine and all the rest of it. But they don't go to the health agency and say, oh, there's another mass further up the road, which means that there's two sets of radiation upon the community. And, you know, it's it's can be, this will affect it greatly. Down from that, there is a bus stop. Now, children will stand at that bus stop, possibly for 20 minutes, half an hour waiting for a bus, five days a week. Will you let your child stand there knowing that the radiation is coming from that mast? Um, there are other areas uh, that they looked at was woeful, frankly. Um, it was all... Apologies, that's... <laughs> No, you're grand. No, you're grand. No, thank you very much. Yeah. And last but not least, we're going to bring in Les Ross to make representation as the agent in support of the application. Uh, Mr. Ross, you have three minutes. Yeah. And whenever, whenever you start the time, we'll kick off. Okay. I'm just trying to find you here. There you go. Thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, hello, members. Um, and thank you to the, uh, to the, speakers who've just spoken as well. Yeah, my name's Les Ross. I'm a planning consultant and I've submitted the planning application. Um, I've been dealing with telecoms applications for more than 20 years. And my company handles all the Vodafone and O2 applications in Northern Ireland. So I'm trying to say I have a bit of experience at this. In the early days, masks were very controversial, but this has now changed completely. We are now regularly approached by communities and political representatives who want new masts in their areas to provide better coverage for their communities and businesses. And the reason for that will be obvious to everybody in this room. It's because mobile phones are widely considered to be essential to modern life. And they're essential for our personal daily communications, for business. Uh, for uh, telecoms infrastructure is absolutely essential to modern businesses, to employment and wealth creation, for education, for healthcare, and for our public services. 
and not least for our emergency services. Mobile coverage is a fundamental piece of infrastructure that enables the delivery of emergency services. And it's essential that we have good coverage, particularly in the bigger urban areas. And obviously that means that we need masks. We are using our phones more. We are downloading more data. And actually, members, that means that more masks are required. Now, this area of Ported Down, in this area of Ported Down, just like every urban area, there is high demand and there is growing demand. And this area is underserved. And it's a place where there's a gap. And this mast is aims to fill that gap and provide a, an adequate level of service. It's a financial, finan financial, uh, and it's a substantial financial investment to provide coverage for the whole community. A variety of siting opportunities were considered, and I'll go through those in questions if you wish. But this site's the best place because it's on a busy roadside. There's a mix of land uses here. The precise siting, and I'll go through this in questions if you wish, aims to avoid residential conflict. It's not easy in this area, but that's what we've aimed to do. We don't want to you know, annoy residents or have objections. It serves the necessary area. So the planning application pack presented provides all the necessary information to demonstrate that this proposal complies with policy. I'm here to assist you with questions, but just closing, I respectfully ask you to endorse the, uh, the officer's recommendation and to approve planning for mission, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Ross, and thank you very much, all the guest speakers. Okay, members, it's over to yourselves. I'm going to open the floor for questions or uh, okay, I'm going to bring on Councillor Duffy. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thanks to all the speakers. I'd like Mr. Ross stated he's been involved in, you know, O2 Vodafone for a long period. Regarding, you know, through his career doing this, does he have much consultation with local residents when this is going on? And in this case, did he have much consultation with the local residents on the placement of this? Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor Duffy, Mr. Ross. Can you, can you help us out on that one? Thank you. Uh, thank you, and through the chair, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, before we uh, submit a planning application, we write to local councillors in the area to advise them that an application is being proposed and to invite uh, feedback. We also write to any uh, local um, schools or um, uh, educational facilities in the area as well, just to advise them. And, and all of that was done in this case. Now. We didn't actually get any responses in this particular case, councillor. I suppose probably the answer to that is, is this area ported down to you or Craig Avon to you? Does councillor Alderman Tinsley? Yeah. Craig, Craig Avon. Craig that falls under Craig Avon. Okay, no problem. Okay, I'm going to bring you back in, councillor Duffy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, no, just on response from the college, would they be getting a financial gain out of this? And is that probably why they wouldn't speak against it? Go and ask the agent for that one, please. Thank you. Sorry, I just realized I need to correct what I said a moment ago. Okay. Um, no, we, we wrote to the local councillors, also to uh, the local MLAs, and we did get one response. I'm sorry, Councillor Tinsley, you did respond to uh, Taylor Patterson at that stage, so I apologize. I just want to correct that for the record. Um, in terms of the, the ownership of the land, this land is considered to be within the roadside verge, and it's uh, it's although the land registry may show it in one way, we consider that to be DFI land, and it was it's it so it's Department for Infrastructure or Road Service who controls that land, and, and there's no financial gain to any party. Many thanks, Councillor Lavery.
Thank you, Chair. I suppose it's another question for the agent. There's been some discussion about alternative sites. You know, there's six mentioned here in the report. So, pose could the agent go into more detail why those alternative sites were less favourable than the proposed site, and why, if if the failed meets the various you know residential amenity criteria and so on, just to give a, a bit more knowledge than maybe is does is outlined in, in the report itself. Thank you. Thank you again, Councillor, and thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, we have we have noted um six alternative sites that we looked at in this area. Um, now, whenever we were doing the study, we actually we we've said the six sites. What we actually do is we we do more than that. Uh, we look at you know multiple sites, and whenever we select a particular area, we we sort of fine tune it there. Um. There are there are two other masts that serve this part of Porta Down. Um, one is a way up towards the the entrance to the hospital, uh, and and the other one is down near. It's a, a BT telephone exchange building, which is down near the KFC in the Lurgan Road and behind the KFC. So those two masts and this site pretty much sits in the middle in the Lurgan Road there. So there's a gap in the system. So we were looking for a place relatively central between those other two masts for this new mast. Um, the, the Lurgan Road um, has a mix of uses, as you all know, um, and you, but there are a lot of residential frontages onto the road. And I have to say, councillors, what we're primarily looking for is a location where you are not putting a mast right in front of, you know, housing, that you're um, that you're offsetting it, or you're put, you're basically you're putting it front of some other use, whether that's commercial, uh, or open space or something like that, that we are not right in front of a residential house. In this case, it's really difficult to do that. So, whenever we, so the the, the report that you have in front of you, members, goes through the, the the individual sites, and I can go through them. I don't, I don't think there's much necessity, chair, to go through every site in detail. Unless, unless members do want me to, I'm happy to do it. But really, every other site, we had a residential dwelling, which would be looking straight into the mast on that same side of the road. We just couldn't find another location where we could offset the mast, make make sure that a residential property wasn't looking straight into the mast. And that's why this site was chosen. And Chairman, it is a, and councillors, it's a hard job to find these masts. As I said, we're really not trying to annoy neighbours. I don't want to be here uh, <laughs> um, uh, and, um, you, you know, having objections and so on. We've done our best to find the best possible site. We believe it's the best possible site, members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor O'Dowd, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, we're talking about the sites. Site four was ruled out because it sat on the edge of the Lurgan Road and would appear very visible. Surely this is going to appear visible only by one tree blackened and it's very, very close to houses. You know, is there... A reason that site four, another reason that site four was ruled out. Um, yes, thank you, councillor. That that there, there's a there's a degree of prominence to site four where it's it's right in in everybody's faces basically uh, on a main approach, whereas this site has the benefit of the trees that it's set amongst. Um, and, and other street f furniture and basically we felt that it wasn't as prominent in the streetscape that we felt that the other site would fail the visual amenity test Go ahead Councillor O'Dowd Thank you Chair But is there as many houses around site 4? 
I don't know it myself, so I'm only asking. Yeah, um, yes, yeah, sir. There's also there's also houses which would look straight across into that mast. Now, those houses, the, the people in those houses do, uh, benefit from a degree of screening, you know, between them and the mast, but it's still directly across from from houses. Thank you very much, Mr. Ross. Help content so far? No problem. Go ahead, Councillor Day, please. Mm -hmm. Is there as many houses? That's what I'm asking. Yes. No, I, I know exactly what you're getting at. There, yes, but we're looking, there are there are houses the whole way along the Lurgan Road and they're spurst along and there's, you know, there's many houses along the road. What we're trying to do is avoid a situation, Councillor Dowd, where someone is looking straight across and the mast is in, in, you know, up, opposite their, their, their property. As, as much as I'm trying to make it as flexible as possible, make sure Sorry. come through myself. <laughs> but surely in, in photograph four, there is houses looking directly at it. Yeah, there's a there there is a house that's a, across the road, but we have positioned the mast to be offset from that house as much as possible, so that it's not in front of the. Yeah, as if we move it further westward along the the, the Lurgan Road, then we're right in front of someone's garden. So we're trying to not be in front of that person's garden. The other house is across the road. It's about 40 odd meters away and it's offset so the people aren't looking direct directly out the window, councillor, across at the mast. It's offset. And you know, we 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 that for me that's a prime consideration because what I'm trying to think of when I'm standing out there and trying to select a mast site is if I lived in that house, would I be annoyed? You know, you know, and we're trying to make sure that it's offset as much as possible to to limit the annoyance to any individual. You know, not and to you know the multiple households as well, but especially you know to those individuals who are very much closest to the site. Many thanks, many thanks. And Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, thanks. It's just when, when the agent sort of mentioned his DFI ground, what's the procedure then? Is that land disposed of or what's the arrangement with DFI in terms of citing that on DFI's property, essentially? What's the process this went through to arrive at that and, you know, What's the approval mechanism from DFA's perspective in that regard? If it is DFA. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. I'm not the acquisition manager. I'll do my best to, to tell you. Um, the there, There's an agreement where DFA allows infrastructure like this on their lands as long as there's no, it's not causing an impediment or it's not interfering with the use that they would have for those lands. So it's, uh, whenever we're out looking for sites, we often look for roadside verges because they, we know that we can work with road service to get those. And every case we can almost, we can get those um, approved through the FA. I'm not sure of the exact mechanisms, and apologize for that. But, um, it, to, and that's the reason I'm not aware is because it's not really a planning consideration, if you know what I mean, uh, Councillor and Chairman. Appreciate that. No, thank you, Alderman Wilson. Going to bring you back in. 
Yeah, I just would be keen to hear from DFA. I don't know Jonathan was signaling that he maybe has a different approach to it, but if we could hear from DFA first and then I'd like to ask Jonathan Buckley the same question. Good evening, Joe. Um, utilities have their own legislation in which they can utilise our verges and our roadways, unfortunately, uh, to, to place services uh, for the community and for industry. Now, that is separate legislation and that empowers them to do that. We are then tasked with ensuring that they reinstate um, to standards. Thanks. We'll bring back, bring you back in, Alderman Wilson. Thank you. And then if we could just hear Jonathan's response to that too, you think? Thank you, uh, Alderman Wilson. I, I think just we'll need some more clarity around this point because it's been quite a convoluted process, actually. Whenever members have become involved um, through residents' objections to this, we've wrote out to the numerous organisations, DFI, Department for Economy, and under the deeds in which one of the objectors has it, it looks as if this piece of land is actually within the ownership of the regional college and ultimately then the responsibility of for the Department of Economy. So we're not actually sure as to the ownership of the particular piece of ground in question as well, because I actually have a copy of the deeds here, is, which states the Southern Education and Library Board in terms of some of the research done by local residents. So I think it's a point of... Um, Clarity needed to that matter. Thank you, Johnny. Aloysius, I'm going to bring you back in. Hello. Um, on the way um, sort of land and deeds work, they may well be owned to the centre of the road, but if they're maintained by the department, they fall within our remit. Um, once we abandon a road, it would fall back to the owner, and that's why it's always on the land ownership, and that would be on the folio. Mm -hmm. But anything that's outside the fence to this centre of the road will be maintained by us, and therefore it's classified as maintained by the department and can be used by utilities. Thank you very much. for bringing back in, Alderman Wilson. Yeah, I suppose just to get, I suppose on a wider theme, I know we'll come across this now and again in terms of actual land that we're dealing with as part of any proposal or application. What's our, you know, ultimately the what cognizance should we give to who owns what? You know, if we can just reiterate that in terms of, you know, specifics to this application. Thank you, Alderman Wilson. I'm going to bring in motion, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Alderman Wilson. Um, as we've discussed before, this committee plan of permission goes with the land. It's not with the person or who owns the land. So the plan of permission obviously very much is, you know, relating to the, the piece of parcel of land that it's on in relation to the ownership of the land, as long as we're satisfied that the P2 has been filled out correctly um, and that the correct notice has been served, then the, the, the application is valid and, and it can proceed on that basis. And at this moment in time, we've not, you know, there's no evidence that it hasn't been filled out correctly. Okay, members, any other questions or comments? Okay, we'll move on to the debate. Okay, members, you may express your views. Right. Well, I'm going to push, move on then to a decision. Can I ask for a proposer and a seconder of sorts? <coughs> Yeah, Alderman Wilson, go ahead. Yeah, it's just I'm not totally okay with this, and I know the last time I wasn't, you know, it was uh, I found it useful um in the other application to actually to see it. And I know we don't, and I've said this the last time, we don't do site visits that often, but I would be proposing that I go and see it. I'm speaking from my own perspective, so um I'd be keen enough to to have a visit and just see. I'm just sort of looking at the topography, I just think, you know, it looks as though the, the ground sort of rises. Um, I used to go to the, the tech many years ago, but it's hard just to remember. I know it seemed to rise up towards the back, 
And I always thought, you know, height was important for signal travel and that type of thing. But I know we're dealing with application that's before us, but I'd still like to just get a wee look at exactly where this is and how close it is to neighboring property. So I'd make that a proposal. Thank you very much, Alderman Wilson. Would have been a long time ago, would it, when you, when you went there? <laughs> Thank you. Alderman Kennedy, please. And then Councillor Duffy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just a second what Alderman Wilson said. The last time I went out for a site visit on the Moss, that totally changed our perplexion of it at all. We'll come back and everybody was nearly in agreement once we were seeing the, the site location. So I think we look at this and would maybe help as well. Yeah, thank you very much, members. We have a proposal and a seconder that we go for a site meeting. Are we all agreed? Agreed? Yeah, great. Thank you very much, members. Okay, thank you very much, members of the public, and thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, members, thank you very much. I'm going to move on to Appendix 1, Application Number LA08-2019-0129F, and it's refusal. its uh, refusal. An applicant is Francis Smith. I'm going to bring in Sinead Megavoy, Planning Manager, to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. Um, but first, first of all, I'm going to bring in our legal, just to give a, a quick sort of spiel, please. Go ahead, on. Okay. Sorry, can I get a proposal and seconder that we go on to confidential, please? Proposed. proposed by the deputy chair and seconded by Councillor McGowan to receive.
it's thank you very much members of the public thank you very much members um okay just to make your work councillor duffy and councillor lavery have um declared an interest and have removed themselves from the the meeting for this application so i'm going to bring in sinead and uh, to present the application over to you sinead thank you thank you chair Members are advised that this application was presented to members on the 6th of September 2023 with a recommendation to refuse. At that meeting, it was agreed that the application be deferred as officers required time to consider the additional information submitted by the agent. Mm -hmm. Officers would advise that the agent sent a report from Stableshire, which is appended at Appendix 1 of your ad uh, addendum report. In addition, officers received a further letter of objection to this proposal. Additional consultation was carried out by the National Environment Division and the Waste Management Unit in light of the additional representations received. For confirmation, National Environment Division have still no objections and Water Management Unit have confirmed if this proposal is approved to use waste as infill, then a waste authorisation will be required. Officers' comments in relation to the report from Stableshire are noted in the latest addendum and officers are still of the opinion that the proposal Development fails to comply with the SPPS and all other relevant policies. And on this basis, there is no change to the officer recommendation the plan of permission should be refused. Just taking it quickly then through the PowerPoint presentation, members, uh, just to refresh your memory. So that's the location of the site within the general area. So it's just the south of Mahri. Next slide, please. And that's an aerial view of the proposed site, including the entire field. Next slide, please. So that's the site location plan that was submitted uh, originally. And then, next slide, please. It was duly amended to uh, take the red line outside the floodplain. So that red line ensures that no development is within the floodplain. Next slide, please. So that is site layout plan showing the levels proposed in addition uh, uh, to the inert waste that will be brought into this site. Um, next slide, please. So that's the site layout plan. Basically, the um, salmon area is a land for infill. Uh, there is an open ditch through the center of the site, which the purple area shows a five meter maintenance strip at each side of that. Uh, and then the area in blue is floodplain. Next slide, please. So that's the close up of the levels because I was conscious of the previous one just to show you the difference in the levels straight to site. Next slide, please. So those are the levels that are approved at the roadside. And as you can recall from the last meeting, and indeed as um, those um, part of the infill to the top end of the site was submitted as the, the road was slightly subsiding at that uh, um, So that level is up to 16.5, almost 17 metres. And the proposed levels here is 14.5 metres, so there is a level difference. Next slide, please. That just shows a flood map of a historical flood event outlined in red. Um, the site, as you could see in your um, location plan, is like a jagged red line, but it takes everything outside the floodplain. Next slide, please. That just shows the historical uh, flood map bracket within the red line of the application site, just showing where it is. Next slide, please. That's just a view from the site of Mahri Road. Uh, some of the um, material that was granted plan of permission to the front end has been brought onto the site, but hasn't been leveled out as yet. Next slide, please. That's just looking back up. So you can see the difference in level that um, material has to be leveled out on this field in which he already has got plan of permission to do. Next slide, please. This is just down the side, so that area where the red line is, basically there is fill approved in that area of the site, uh, right to the end of the road. Next slide, please. So the bottom of the site where the red line is, um, that part cannot be filled because that goes into the floodplain, so there's only a small portion between what was um, granted and um, the floodplain that will be allowed to be filled, so that entire field cannot be infilled under this plan application. Next slide, please. That's just looking up in relation to the land in green is the field beyond the red line, which is the floodplain. Um, and then the sort of brown area is the, the field in which we're talking about. Next slide, please. That is just a view of the field in front of number 10 in a small road, which is basically um the area of the, the site that's in the floodplain um, and was re-sowed and grassed out 
um, in line with what we would find acceptable as land improvement. Next slide, please. So that's photo seven, basically at the recent flood event there in November 2023. Um, the objector sent in photos regard to that field that what is green now was basically submerged in water as that is the floodplain. And that's it, I think, members. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks, Shania. Okay, members. Doors open to yourselves. I'm going to open that and invite us for questions. Yeah, Councillor O'Day, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the excava excavated soil from the contaminated sites is going into this, but what's to stop that then from going into the water courses? You know, surely there's an issue there. Sorry, I should have been speaking to yourself. Yes, uh, through the chair, with this particular application, there are um, construction management plans. And if you were reminded to approve that before development would start in the site, you'd have to put silt fences right around the edge of that red line. And that's protect any particular um, inert material to overflow from the site into the water courses. Uh, so that's why there is a five metre waiting strip between the open ditch. You can't come down to the bottom because that's in the floodplain. So that has to be uh, left uh, free as well. So if you're reminded to approve it, it had to come back with quite stringent conditions, but a self fence is what it's called. It's basically a fence to stop any sort of debris moving beyond the, the site into the water courses. Thank you, Chair. But surely nothing's guaranteed. Like this contaminated, you know, Substances can still get in to the waterways, you know, surely that's a major issue. Yeah, just if we could tear the condition, those conditions must be enforceable. So we would have to enforce to ensure that that cell fence is constructed in line with what they've submitted to us to stop that happening. And the type of material coming in would have to be controlled as regards to was inert material, soil and um, stone only. There can't be any other contaminated or hazardous waste, etc. So that would have to be controlled. And indeed, a waste authorization would be required at all. So there'll be an onus on us uh, to place conditions on it. And would the, there could be conditions attached to this that would control where the waste um, or the inert material would go. Many thanks, Jeanette. And Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, thanks. And that clarity is useful because I was under the impression from the last time that it wasn't, you know, toxic in any way. The the type of waste that was proposed, it was, you know, soil and, and debris and that that type of thing. So that clarity is, it is useful. And I, I know from the, I was flicking back through there to a photo in the original um, presentation in, in the September and I know photo four from Ennismore Road to me showed, you know, quite a, you know, a, a useful illustration of, I suppose, in my mind, what the applicant is obviously trying to do here, which is improve the land. And it looked quite wet, you know, when the trees were in full bloom, which is probably, you know, during the summer or maybe early, early summer period. It doesn't date the photos, but the ground looked quite wet and quite unusable. And I'm just wondering, in terms of this application, do we have, a, you know, to improve the ground, it seems an open-ended sort of descriptor. Do we have, you know, any way of measuring improvement? How do we say that it isn't going to be an improvement? You know, in my mind, looking at it and, and looking at the condition of the ground, you know, taking that back with some good hard fill and then topping it off with soil and returning it to, to agricultural condition would surely be an improvement. I'm just wondering what, what planners, you know, parameters are in that or how do they measure that?
Well, for us, um, Alderman, we have to follow the policy. And the policy basically says to improve land form, you're reducing steep gradients. So basically, where agricultural vehicles are going onto the land, but it's far too steep for them to do anything with it. Bringing in inert waste would actually be a form of land improvement. And we're saying this is not the case here because it will not reduce steep gradients. And basically putting in this amount of waste, it does, it does not amount to, in our mind, in accordance with the policy, land improvement. You'll see the green field to the south of the site, which is in the floodplain. That was simply re out and used as agricultural land, even though it was um, covered in water in November 2023. It was simply sold out with grass on it. So we would say that's a form of uh, land improvement, doesn't require a plan of permission. The policy says land improvement is to reduce steep gradients, and this is not the case we are saying with this particular application, we are saying it mounts actually to landfill rather than land improvement. Alderman Wilson. Yeah, I suppose going, you know, you've talked about the original approval for, for Phil. I know looking at the pictures, it doesn't look as though that has been, you know, distributed across the site, but without seeing it, it looks like it falls away going by the levels. So, you know, leveling up the ground and, and making it less susceptible to, to flooding and more useful, given the fact that it does flood. Is that not, in your view, you know, an improvement, considering we have an approval existing at the top end and this is simply an extension of it? Would it lead to, you know, if we don't approve this, does it lead to like an unacceptable sort of drop off to a lower level that would then make that lower part completely unusable? Or, you know, I'm just, it's hard to visualize it without being there, but I was just keen to, to understand, you know, we do have an approval and the material is there. It looks like an addition to that material to, to further extend the improvement. Yes, Alderman, the, the uh, approval to the top has sloped it down into the field. So there was quite a substantial amount of fin fill granted at the top, basically because the road was subsiding to bring it up in level of the road and then to lease it off in, in line with uh, the rest of the field, which we found acceptable uh, because there was an overriding issue there as regards to that road was slightly subsiding at the top. And then that's why the infill, as you can see, was brought even on back to allow that gradual slope into it. Um, but this, if this were to be approved, it wouldn't even go as far as that because this level that they're showing here is a lot lower than what was approved at the top. So it's slightly contradicting what we had previously approved. Uh, but that was the override reason why we allowed that top bit because of the subsidence to the road there and just to bring the landform up right adjoining to the road. And then just to then that under that top approval will blend right into the land and then can be re-sowed out and grassed. Okay, thank you very much. Alderman Wilson, okay, members, any other questions? Or, uh, Councillor Donnelly, please. Surely a site visit would be more appropriate here in this one to see what it actually does look like. Some pictures, there's pictures of floods there, and there's pictures taken different times of the year, probably. It's the way it... yeah, thank you very much. Sort of jumped, jumped on to the next stage there. Uh, okay, members, no other questions. We move on to um, your comments. Yeah, we've had comments from Councillor Donnelly going to listen to Alwyn Wilson. Uh, yeah. Uh, Councillor died. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's, it's one of would. You know, just to, to move it on in, in terms of the discussion, I think a site visit would be useful to see just the, the differences in levels on that. And it would be um I would be content with, with that approach if it if it was coming that way. And Kaiser died. Thank you. No, I agree with both uh, Alden Wilson and Councillor Downey. Um, and Ald Alderman Kennedy, <laughs> Alderman Kennedy, please. Thank you, Chair. Just a, a side visit at the minute when the other soil hasn't been leveled, it'd be giving you a false impression. You know, those piles of soil would need to have been leveled to where they should have been, you know, to, to, to let like you see with a green. You're going out now and there's big piles of soil and then a sloping field. It doesn't really 
you know, you nearly bit of deferring it away to, to the springtime till he gets chunked to level that soil more so than you go out now, it's not going to give it through a count of it, you know, but you're going to be big piles of soil, giving it a thinking, you know, it is a mountain of a slope where it's not, if that was leveled out, it, it, it probably wouldn't look as drastic, but it's up to yourselves. Okay, thank you very much, Sullivan. Okay, members, going to move on to decision. There's no other lights on. Yeah. <clears throat> Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, just based on the conversation, I would be keen enough to say it. I understand what Gordon Councillor or Alderman Kennedy said, but I would be keen to, to see it. So I would propose that we do go and, and have a look at it. Yeah, thank you for your very much, Alderman Wilson. It's proposed that we go out for a site meeting. Uh, can I get a seconder, Councillor Donnelly? Thank you, Chair. I'll second that motion. Yeah, thank you very much, members. Proposed by Alderman Wilson, second by Councillor Don Donnelly, that we go for a, a site visit. You all agreed? Yeah, agreed. Thank you very much, members. Move on to... Appendix
Okay, thank you very much, members. Move on to appendix three, application number LA08 2021 0734F, and also refusal. Uh, the applicant is Ben McCaggy. Going to bring in Roshin Hamill, the principal principal planning officer, to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, Roshin, it's over to you, please. Thank you, Chair. This application seeks full plan of permission for the erection of 12 apartments and associated works on lands to the rear of Avenue Road in Lurgan. Members will note that an addendum has been circulated prior to the meeting to address issues raised in a recent submission by the agent. The application site lies within the development limit for Lurgan on white land. The site is located 60 metres to the rear of buildings at front onto Avenue Road and is served by a 4.8 metre wide access, which also serves the rear of the existing dwellings along the street. In terms of the principle of development, the site was previously used for storage associated with a nearby manufacturing business, and as such, the last use was industrial. Policy PED 7 of PPS 4 states that on unzoned land, a development proposal that will result in the loss of existing Class B2, B3 or B4 use, or land last used for these purposes, will only be permitted where it is demonstrated that it meets one or more of listed criteria. In this case, officers consider it has not been demonstrated that the proposal complies with PED 7 of PPS 4, and therefore the principle of development for residential purposes is not acceptable. In terms of design and layout, officers are of the view that the proposal is unacceptable in terms of density and represents overdevelopment of the site. The proposal consists of two blocks of six apartments, three stories in height, and provides 91 dwellings per hectare. The density of development within the immediate area on average works out 38 dwellings per hectare. In terms of parking, the proposal offers no on-site parking. The parking statement submitted in support of the application highlights an availability of parking on the Avenue Road and in nearby car parks. Given the inner urban location, the lack of on-site parking is acceptable in policy terms. However, as proposed development is set back from Avenue Road in excess of 60 metres and accessed via an unsurveilled, unlit right-of-way located between two rows of dwellings, the proposal does not promote personal safety and does not provide adequate and convenient access to parking or public transport. A total of 10 letters of objection from seven postal addresses have been received and officers' consideration of the matters raised have been detailed in the report circulated. For the reasons set out in the report, officers are recommend that the application be refused on the grounds that it is contrary to the SPPS and policies PPS4, PPS7 and PPS3. And I'll just take you through the slides. And that's the location of the site within the general area. It's in Lurgan as you head out towards Dollingstown. <laughs> this is an aerial view of the proposed site. You can see the, uh, the application site outlined in red with the access also outlined in red. And this is our site location plan. Again, you can see the application site outlined in red and a right way in green. And this is the proposed site layout plan, as we've set, as, as obviously set out. Um, the proposed some twelve apartments in two blocks, which sort of appears as four four blocks on the layout. And that's just a close up of the proposed site layout. And as you can see, there's no parking provision within the this this part of the application site. Mm -hmm. And these are the proposed elevations. So the top is the front elevation of the proposed apartments, and the side elevation. And then that's the rear elevation of the proposed apartments and the other side elevation. And this is our proposed ground floor plan. And first floor plans. And second floor plans. Uh, this photograph is viewed down the access to the site from the Avenue Road. And these are views, these are views, some views just across the site. This is looking south towards the Jethro Centre. You can see it in the background there, this community building. And this is another view towards the east. Um, there's an existing car park to the other side of the fence and that vegetation which sits on the opposite side of the fence. And this is another view of a site again, looking towards the, the Jethro Centre with that community building to the south. And this is a view of the site looking up towards the Avenue Road, and this is the, the access way that would provide for pedestrian traffic. And this is just a view of the terrace housing on the Avenue Road. And another view of the terrace housing that exists on Avenue Road. And um, this is an apartment block, which is quite close to the site on the opposite side of the Avenue Road. Um, quite slim in certain ways, but it does provide for on-site parking. 
And then this is just a view of the streetscape onto the Avenue Road. Thank you, members. Yeah, thank you very much, Roisin. Okay, members, we have an attendance planning consultant, Gemma Jobbing, and road engineer, Simon Work to make representation in support of the application and their via Zoom. Okay, Gemma, you're welcome. Um, uh, Gemma, are you the one that's speaking here? Yes, I am indeed. And Simon's available to answer any questions along with the architect, David Hare, afterwards if the members have any questions. No problem. Thank you very much. And you're very much welcome. And David, you're very much welcome as well. Okay, so whenever you start, the, the clock will start. Okay, so whenever the, the timer finishes, that's that's when I'll cut you off. Okay, so um, over to yourself then, Gemma. Thank you. Thank you. Members, we're here today to ask you to approve this application for an innovative affordable housing scheme. We believe this represents a quality, sustainable de design that will not only offer affordable price, but will offer affordable living by removing the need for reliance on the car as it's within walking distance of local services. The design hasn't been dictated by private car. Instead, the applicant has designed a scheme that focuses on best practice to encourage uh, to reduce reliance on car use and instead encourage pedestrian movements and cycle use. Members, this is entirely consistent with overarching planning policy set out in the SPPS, PPS 7 and PPS 3. And in fact, this approach is being promoted in your own new local development plan preparation and is a central theme in the Council's community plan. The SPPS says that we need to move towards more compact towns and encourages development of brownfield and vacant sites just like this. This site is within two minutes walk of the town centre. It's surrounded by housing, apartments, um, shops, schools uh, and other local services. This laneway is already used by residential properties and backland development including mm -hmm. apartment schemes have been permitted along this laneway all under PPS 7. Therefore, this came as uh, this re recommendation came as a shock. The refusal reasons um, were were a surprise to the applicant. They had been in discussions with the planning officers and felt that they were moving towards an approval. In terms of policy, PED seven that uh, Roshin referred to, the planners uh, had agreed in writing that this could be overcome. We say it's uh, compliant with criteria E of PED seven in that it's not really suitable into industrial use because of the the narrow width of the access and also the fact that it's surrounded by housing. So on that basis, we we feel we've complied with PED seven. Contextually, in terms of the local area, the site's surrounded by housing and local services. This, this scheme reflects that. It reflects the density. Yes, it's higher density, but it reflects the new apartment schemes that have also been granted of a similar density in the local area. And the only way we can achieve this more compact form is by by doing that. But nevertheless, the applicant did offer to reduce the scheme by 25%. I don't believe that's in the members' packs, but happy to pick up on that. And then finally, in terms of the, the final reason for refusal, AMP1, this is the first time in two years that's been raised to us and we're certainly happy to look at it. But nevertheless, we say it meets the, this policy. The houses or the apartments are all designed to lifetime homes. There's level access to the site. There's level access along the lane and it's closely um, cited to, to local shops and services. Um, and it's ideally suited to a wide range of users. Uh, finally, members, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gemma. Quick speed there to get the last few words in. Um, <laughs> thank you. And okay, as as Gemma did, made just a word, David Herr is the agent and he's also here um, in attendance. Okay, so, members, Going to open the floor for uh, any questions. Yeah. Going to bring in Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, it's just a, I suppose it's a, a catch-all sort of question. What type of, you know, is residential ruled out in policy terms or is there an acceptable level of residential accommodation that could be approved there or is it just a complete no-no in the policy? Because I know... 
will go through them list of um, industrial sort of uses and that and fallbacks and that type of thing. Is that a question? Sorry. Sorry. That's terrible, Shane. Thank you. Thank you, Aldo Wilson. Sorry. Obviously, you'll note from the reasons for refusal, there is a reason for refusal there on page seven, the fact that this was last used as industrial land, and there is a presumption against the loss of that, unless it's demonstrated that it meets some of the criteria set out in page seven. Now, Nothing has been submitted to us to demonstrate that it couldn't be used for industrial purposes, that you know it's been marketed and it, it you know it's no longer needed, or that there's existing industrial land available elsewhere. We've had nothing submitted to us to try and address that that point. So the onus really is, uh, you know, I suppose on the the applicant agent to demonstrate that you know it can't be used for industrial purposes or shouldn't be used for it or isn't needed for industrial purposes. So for that reason, we're saying, you know, in principle, it's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. If that were addressed. We're not saying that residential use wouldn't be acceptable because it is primarily a residential area, but at just this moment in time, we don't have any evidence to demonstrate that. Well, may I say something? Come back. Do you want to come back in, Alderman Wilson, please? Yeah, and that's useful clarity in that regard because you know, looking at it, it's you know, it doesn't. Looking from the from the satellite imagery, it doesn't lend itself really, in my view, to you know any form of industrial um use, given the fact you know it's accessed through that um narrow residential um avenue, if you like. So, I suppose one for the for the agent that was speaking there previously has any evidence been supplied as per the planners um queries there in terms of the reasons why. You know there wouldn't be a, an industrial use i can sort of see why it wouldn't be suitable but that doesn't really mean anything unless there is you know evidence placed before the planner so has that opportunity been used is there evidence um how have you sought to get around that and that's for the agent okay many thanks solomon wilson do you want to answer that one david okay. first time i've been here so I on now, am I? Yeah. Basically, that was used for Mid-Ulster Granite. Mid-Ulster Granite would have been storing concrete slabs. They'd have been, there's a, a shed or a, or a shed where they'd have been cutting slabs with a lot of dust and a lot of various bits and pieces. To cut a long story short, you know, it's not fit for a purpose. You, the, the lane may, you can't drive down there. You can't turn an articulated lorry. You know, the access to the front is substandard. We can't provide two by 33 side splays at the front either. So the reality is it does not, it, it would fall under being able to change that. There's also precedent set in the local area, namely Franklin Park, Franklin building in Lurgan, which was a factory in the middle sandwiched, basically near Lurgan Hospital, where it was sandwiched between two different residential blocks and planners granted 28 houses and and took that use away from that particular area in 2015. So there is a precedent set that this can be acceptable. You know, I we I, I couldn't attend a, an office meeting with Roisin and, and, and a colleague because my dad was sick. So uh, my client went along with a Joe Nelson, who we they talked about various things, and I have obviously in my report said that we can overcome PD seven. So in my like, yes, I can provide. We can provide other evidence. The, the evidence was uh, there is evidence in there from Simon work stating that it's substandard and it wouldn't work. So in my eyes, if we need more substantial evidence brought to the table in reference to this not being fit for purpose. We have no issues doing that. But an email came from the planner, which I have attached in in that document and basically said, we are discussed we 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 discussed the reasons for refusal and content that you can make a reasonable argument to overcome PED seven. And there are similar cases on the portal which I can direct you to in due course. So in my eyes, that that particular part of the policy can be overcome. Yeah, many thanks. Um, Councillor O'Dowd, please.
just one wee question. When was the last time it was used for industrial use? I'm not familiar with that area at all. Uh, so my, I, I can find out off Ken Row, but Ken Row, when, when did you purchase that one? Ben has purchased seven years, so I would say seven years ago. Hang on, hang on, ma'am. Okay, we're in the committee meeting here. Okay, yeah, <laughs> so rather than shitting across, okay, so what, what's your, your question, Ken Row Dowd, please? So it's just been sitting idle. It hasn't been used for anything. Basically, yes. And Roisin, do you want to come in? Sorry, yes, members, just to reiterate the point, yes, the, it has been, it's sitting vacant, but it was last used for industrial purposes. And I fully take the point that, that you know, this could be addressed, but we don't have any supporting statement. We don't have any evidence in front of us to, to address that point. And in relation to the, the Franklin Mills application that you refer to, there was information submitted to address that point in policy. And that's the reason that got over the line. Thank you very much, Oisin. And Councillor O'Dowd, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, can you supply what the council needs to to change that? And I know housing is cried out for throughout the whole of Lurgan, and I think the more the better at the minute. If we can. I'll answer your question, okay, members. Okay, any other questions? Not online. Okay, members, go to on, move on to your debate and your, with your thoughts here now. Alder Wilson, please. Yes, yeah, just um, following on from Councillor O'Dowd and my own question. I think we're sort of pointing towards uh, maybe a window opportunity for the, the agent to supply that information. I think it would be useful. To have I know he did he did state there that you know he had an issue attending a meeting when his was father wasn't well and that so I suppose from from that perspective I would be of the view that we I know planners like to get things concluded and we are a bit of a victim sometimes of delay and and, and all the rest of it and that impacts our statistics and we we don't want that but I suppose in these circumstances I would be content enough just to see just looking at how you know useless the site is for other purposes looking at from the air and i know we have a limited view of it here but you know as has been said housing in a residential area would be more in my view would be more favorable than um an industrial use and that we tight zone there but you know that's my view i would be happy to give them that opportunity hey, thanks Sullivan, and i'm going to bring back in roshin uh, thank you, Chair. And look, it would just be remiss of me to, to not to say that's one point of policy that we feel the proposal is unacceptable. Even if that information were to be submitted, there are still other points of policy that we feel is unacceptable in terms of this proposal, relating mainly to the lack of on-site parking. And yes, information has been submitted to show that there is parking available in the vicinity, but it's accessed by a narrow lane that's not surveilled, it's not lit. It would require pedestrians to walk quite a bit. So in our view, we don't feel that the parking is particularly accessible or convenient. So even if that information were submitted, it, it's not to say that we would be changing our recommendation because that point still would have to be addressed. Yeah. Alderman or Councillor Mulholland. Yes, I'm just looking here at the... Uh presentation and um, on slide number three I'm just taking a look at that and there seems to be an area to the right of the outline in red is for the current plot of land I was just wondering there seems to be cars parked on that and what's that generally used for and if this was going ahead would the housing there have the availability to use that or is it owned privately by something else Thank you. Yeah. 
just to confirm it's page three in the on appendix three, yeah. Stay three. With the big arrow with the, yeah. like a thumb on the end of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna bring in the applicant there to a Stanley Abram owns that as part of a Abrams car car motors. That originally was a factory and it was demolished uh, a few years ago and he parks his cars in that. Stanley has also given us, and you'll see underlined in blue, an area where additionally pedestrians, if need be, can walk in it as well because we have a, we have a three meter strip at least of a right of way to bring services down in, which Stanley has kindly agreed to. Bring in Roisin here, please. Just to follow up on that point, um, it, it, it would mean that they couldn't use it for parking. It, it's not available for parking and there's no pedestrian links between that site and the current site at the moment. Yeah, members, move on. If there's no other comments to make or questions for a decision, can I ask it this for a decision, please, members? And Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, I know I'm taking, you know, cognizance of what Roisin Planner has said. I, th I think it would be fair to allow them to respond to those um outstanding queries and it would make it a proposal that we do defer to allow that and maybe they can elaborate on then the access issues and maybe overcome them as part of you know sort of a review of it if possible and um, so i would just ask that it is deferred to allow that time frame for the agent to address those concerns as he has intimated here today and councillor o'dowd please I just like to second Alderman Wilson's <clears throat> proposal, sir. Yeah, yeah, members, you've got a proposal by Alderman Wilson. That we deferred for more information and second by Councillor Dowd. You all agreed? Agreed. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much, David. Thank you very much online. Yeah. I'll move on to Appendix 4, application number LS08 2022 0841F, and it's an approval for MM Freight Limit. Councillor Lavery and then Councillor McGowan. Go ahead, Councillor Lavery. Do we need to wait for the people to come in or? Let's go ahead. All right, but I've declared an interest as well. I suppose we just do that now. Um, I suppose I was contacted by a number of residents, both by in person, by phone, by email, regarding this application. But at the time, it was a member of the planning committee and notified them that I would not be able to respond, you know, given that in order to uh, keep the process clean and, you know, only give like planning guidance on how things are decided. However, when I was doing some research there on the Thursday or Friday, I discovered that my employer had submitted a written letter of objection to the planning application, unbeknownst to me as, as I don't get involved in that kind of casework. I've spoke to Anne there at the time and again today, and suppose the advice is that there may be a conceived, a conceived bias uh, due to let my employer submit the letter of objection. Uh, and it may cause particular concerns if uh, it got to the point where the officer recommendation was overturned and a refusal was laid down. But then I would potentially, you know, that may be open to counsel to legal action, either by JR or a, a route of appeal for the applicant. Therefore, so given that guidance from the legal advisor, I'm going to have to declare that interest and therefore not take part in the application in order, you know, whatever the outcome that there's. No potential you know, legal recourse. So, given that, I'm just going to have to recuse myself. Thank no you. problem. Thank you very much, Councillor Lavery. Julie noted. Councillor McGowan, please. I'd just like to declare an interest as well as I have met with the objectors. 
And can you roll down, please? I'm also declaring an interest, sorry. <clears throat> a family member has sent in a letter of objection and I would just excuse myself, thank you. Okay, yeah, members, move on to Appendix 4. Um, we have a number of guest speakers as well. And first of all, I'm going to bring in Sinead McAvoy, Planning Manager, to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. So over to yourself, Sinead. Thank you, Chair. This application is for a food storage warehouse and distribution facility and an ancillary new head office, service yard, overflow parking area, fueling bays, wash bay, guard lodge, wash tank, substation, employee and visitor car parking area and all associated site works. And the reason is before the plan regularly service committee tonight is because it's a major application. Officers have taken that members have read the report, including the addendum in full, and as such, this will be a synopsis only. The application site located within the development limit of Craigavon and land zoned as existing industrial land as identified in the Craigavon Area Plan 2010. Officers are satisfied this proposal is compatible with the predominant industrial employment use, is of a scale, nature and form appropriate to the location and approval would not lead to a significant dementation in the industrial employment resource both in the locality and the plan area generally. As such, this proposal complies with the land use zone in the plan. The site layout, building design, associated infrastructure and landscaping arrangements have all been fully considered within the officer's report and it has been concluded that the proposal is compatible with the surrounding area in, te in terms of scale, form, massing and use of materials. As regards to impact on residential amenity, the site will operate on a 24-hour day, seven days a week basis. However, there will be seasonal variations to the number of HGVs accessed in this site. The application was accompanied with a noise impact assessment and an air quality impact assessment. And this has been assessed by an environmental health office who offer no objections subject to conditions attached. As regards to access, traffic and parking, the proposal involves the use of an existing access from the site onto an access road located beside Lockview Park and Ride to the southwest of the site, as well as a service access to the southeast of the site taken from the Ansborough Industrial Estate Access Road. The application was accompanied by a transport assessment form and transport notes. In addition, DFI roads have carried out further analysis and observation of queue lengths and associated delay at the Ansborough Road Lock Road a Junction, the Lockview Lock Road Junction, using a maximum early impact using a maximum early impact envisaged and the lowest peak background figures available, a less than five percent impact has been concluded. Uh, the parking proposed meets with the worst case scenario parking situation for this development and DFI roads, the common authority in these ma matters, have been through the detail of these reports and offer no objections subject to conditions. Flooding and drainage and ecology, ground risk uh, contamination reports have all been submitted and appraised by the relevant common authorities who offer no objections subject to conditions. There have been 94 third party representations and four petitions. Uh, to this proposal. It is noted that a without prejudice list of amended conditions were also received to the publication of this report in which officers have responded by way of an addendum to members. In conclusion, after undertaking a policy assessment and plan and balancing exercise, officers of the opinion that the post development complies with the area plan, the SPPS and all other relevant planning policies on this basis, subject to your conditions attached, it is recommended the plan of permission be granted. Taking it through the PowerPoint presentation, members. That's location of the site within the general area uh, to the south of the M1 motorway. Next slide, please. 
and that's the location of the site within the general area outlined in red. You can see the access to the site eh, from the southeast from Lansborough Road and then to the east from the or from the west from the Lock Road. Next slide, please. That's the location of the site within the Craigavon area plan. So that light pink wash is existing industrial land. And to the south of that, you can see you have denoted residential uses and to the east, which is white land, that's now been residential uses also. Next slide, please. So that's just the site location plan to the south of that unit one. Next slide, please. So that's proposed site layout. So the um, warehouse will be situated to the northwest of the site. Uh, with car parking uh, to the south and then HGV and trailer parking uh, to the south and southeast. Next slide, please. So the poor uh, warehouse elevation, so that's what they look like. Um, uh, the loading bays will be to the eastern elevation and then the office will be into the northern uh, elevation. Next slide, please. So that's the post office elevation as you come off the lock road. It'll be situated there and um, there's a level difference in the site, so it'll be accessed at first floor level. Next slide, please. So that's an overview of the floor plans in which the office is an, is an integral part of the warehouse. Next slide, please. So there's a proposed landscaping plan around the periphery of the site in which proposed landscaping and um, wildlife meadow, etc., had to be uh, proposed. Next slide, please. That's the site sections in relation to the acoustic fence. So you can see up in the northeast corner, the light highlighted in red, it's where the acoustic three meter fence is. And then there to the uh, southeast or southwest here is outlined in blue, which is around the gantry building, where there also has to be an acoustic fence. Next slide, please. So that is site and condition of members reminded to approve the application, but basically where there have to be a, a maximum of a five plug-in for the chiller. So it's actually on the loading base, which they would be then plugged into the warehouse. Next slide, please. That just shows a visual representation of the office section and car parking area. So the land uh, drops quite significantly, three and a half metres to the uh, southeast of the site. So it's proposed to work with the land form. So the top car parking area will have a, a link to the office section and then step down by a Gavian wall to the main office or main warehouse section of the building. Next slide, please. So that just shows the level difference. So the top part is the car parking only. HGVs can't come in there. And the same the south, the, the car parking is, or the HGV parking, car parking can't come in that way. So it's just the level difference um, provided. Next slide, please. So that's an, a visual representation of the overall site layout um, proposed. Next slide, please. So that's a view from the lock road to the car park, uh, looking over the site. Next slide, please. So that's an acoustic fence to reconstruct it uh, there to the east and to the north, um, right around the site. Next slide, please. That's um, showing the actual location into the site from the Ansborough Road. Next slide, please. That's the location of the temporary building to the northeast. This hasn't got planning permission as yet, but has been constructed. Next slide, please. This shows a view, it's actually a, a Google image from the M1 motorway, just showing where the site lies in, in regards to that. So it is a lower level uh, than the M1 uh, motorway. Next slide, please. That just shows a site from the access in the industrial estate. So that's up the Ansborough Road. Next slide, please. And that's a site taken from, um, just looking out onto the, sorry, that top heading is incorrect. That's uh, coming out of the industrial estate um, onto the Ansborough Road. You will note some of the representations have referred to runover of HGV vehicle, uh, vehicles on the grass verge. I think that's it, members. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Sinead. Members, and then the report has been circling it's in your, your minutes. Uh, we also have Doug Beatty, Emily, to make representation in objection. We have Nolene Gorman, spokesperson, to make representation in objection. And we have Mr. John Skelly to make representation as the agent. We have also the following in attendance via Zoom, who's speaking rights for clarification purposes only. Uh, James Shaw from Hepworth Consultants, Luke Jones from Mode Transport, John Laverty from Laid Cons Consulting, also in attendance, Oasis Loughran from Road Service, David Sheard 
from Road Service and Nell Curry from Environmental Health. Okay, so we're going to bring in Doug Beatty. Doug, you have five minutes to make representation and obviously whenever the five minutes is over, I'll have to cut you off. Okay, and you're very much welcome. Sure, thank you. Give me two seconds to find you here. <laughs> Oh, go ahead, Doug. Do I need to press this? No, I'm on. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'm I'm here to oppose this development on behalf of the Ainsbury Residents uh, Group. Um, a favourable con consideration has been given to this development proposal because it's within uh, settlement limits and on zoned land, providing the follow following criteria is, is met. And I'm going to talk about four of those. First of all, the proposal is sensitive to the size and character. Uh, of the settlement and remembering, of course, we gave planning permission for an increased size of the settlement that, that we have in, the, in that area, where there is no other industrial unit on this location, the same term of size, nature uh, and design. Uh, another criteria is there's no significant effect on the amenities. Well, currently at the site, currently as the site operates, there are significant effects on the amenities uh, and they are based around noise, uh, pollution, uh, sorry, noise and pollution, uh, and uh, they are significant uh, and will be touched on later on. Uh, there is no conf significant conflict with conservation interests. Well, this site sits within the Loch Ney Special Protection Area uh, and the Loch Ney Ramsar site, where potential pollutants can be transported downstream to a European designated site. And that is something you must take into consideration. Uh, and finally, there are satisfactory arrangements for access and parking. Um, and I'll go into this when I talk a little bit about uh, the inadequacy of the uh, infrastructure. Uh, planning policy statement for paragraph 4.12 states, uh, it is important that major mixed-use sites involving industrial and business development that would attract a significant number of trips should be in locations that have adequate infrastructure. Well, traffic has changed sub, uh, substantially over the last 15 years uh, when the uh, Ainsbury Road Junction uh, was upgraded. Uh, this main junction that will serve this application, there's approximately 220 plus residential properties with a further 180 approved by this committee in Hunter's Lodge and Drumna Walk. And with this committee passing both those applications, you will be aware that there are no plans for another entrance or exit. That's up to 420 residential properties in the immediate vicinity feeding onto the Ainsbury Road. In an early traffic management plan, it provided one recommendation for HGVs not to use the Kinego embankment access to the motorway. That recommendation has subsequently been removed because no way could that condition be enforceable. Planners have disregarded that issue completely. Surely that in itself raises a red flag. The staff car parking facility only has access to the lock road through the lock view complex. I believe this will add to an already unacceptable situation that currently exists at this junction. TransLink, who uses this complex for their 209, 251, 261, 270 uh, and 273 routes, are in discussion about moving their park and ride facility because of road safety issues. That raises a question, if this access is not suitable for TransLink, then why should it be suitable for 100 plus more cars journeys each day? Noise. Members will be aware that there is a precedence for noise disturbance due to chiller uh, trailers running close to residential homes. All major information to confirm their goods are being kept at a certain temperature. Therefore, under no circumstances will trailer products ever be turned off until they've been loaded, offloaded, the five electrical plugins that applicants have now put forward would be grossly inadequate. Uh, in summary, uh, before I raise two further issues, despite consult and consultants not raising any issues in terms of road safety and transport, without being familiar with the site, it is simply not possible for members to take into account over 200 objections. That is almost every household in the Ainsbury estate. Those concerns deserve to be given proper consideration. Uh, and I would urge members to do a side visit to be able uh, to see the issue. The other thing that we have to raise, uh, and we need to be aware that at this moment in time, and it was mentioned earlier, there are two unauthorized operations taking place on that site. And there is uh, enforcement uh, action being taken uh, in regards to that. The residents will also be 
also like the committee to know and be aware of the existence of coal store in Ainsbury Industrial Estate with 10 loading bays sitting idle at present. We've been informed this coal store is owned by uh, Amer Americold and could become operational at any time. And that in itself is going to increase um, uh, the noise levels uh, and the access of vehicles into the site. Uh, Chair, there's a lot I covered there, but thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thank you very much, Doug. And Nolene, going to bring yourself in, take a deep breath. Uh, you have three minutes, okay? So whenever you start, the clock will start as well, okay? I'm here on behalf of the Ansborough Residence Group to express our opposition to this planning application. Firstly, noise. The media proximity of the proposed operations to residential dwellings is a cause of concern. Low level noise from refrigerator units running 24 7 and the continued exposure to unwanted noise can trigger anxiety, stress, and affect mental health. The proposal is therefore contrary to the general criteria laid out in PED 9B and E of Planning Policy Statement 4, Planning and Economic Development. It will harm the amenities of nearby residents by noise of away from noise nuisance. Secondly, traffic. This application will bring increased traffic to the Ansbury Road. The HGVs will undoubtedly affect the flow and therefore, therefore impact residents of the surrounding five developments with the ability to join traffic being compromised. The DFI roads monitoring of the level of HGV traffic access in Ansbury industrial states predates additional planning applications now being considered in the area. The cumulative effect will be considered regardless of existing areas zoned. The proposal is therefore contrary to criteria PED 9G of planning policy statement 4 and AMP2A of planning policy statement 3, as will inconvenience the flow of traffic and prejudice road safety with HDV traffic overcutting verges close to pedestrian pathways. Thirdly, pollution. The build-up of traffic due to the addition of HDVs will result in congestion along the Ansborough Road, which in turn will result in more pollution to the vehicles queuing. The Ansborough Road is, the, is a thoroughfare for dog walkers, families, especially young families. It is also an area of, of uh, the National Cycle Network, highlighted in map, map 04 of the Craigavon Planning Area of 2010. Poor air quality poses a real hidden danger. Air pollution has a significant effect on public health. Poor air quality is the largest environmental risk to public health in the UK. According to asthma and lung, UK respiratory diseases is one of the, the top three killers in Northern Ireland. Around 800 people in Northern Ireland die early every year due to dirty air. The proposal is therefore contrary to criteria PED 9B and F of Planning Policy Statement 4 and that is not capable of dealing satisfactorily with operational emissions and these impacts will harm the amenities and the health of, our, of us ourselves, our residents. Fourthly, character of the area. We urge the committee to reject this proposal and pr protect residents from a future of uncertainty. Residents are aware this is an area zoned and exists in industrial land. However, planning has permitted the continuing development of residential homes within the immediate area. It is therefore evident the nature of the area has changed. Ansborough cannot be considered consoling industrial in character as it has changed since publication of Kagavan Area Plan 2010. We are now in 2023. 20, the area plan is outdated with no specific requirements, requirements and is currently being renewed as part of the development. Some residents were approached by the applicant six days ago. I'm um, making aware of the recommendation to be approved by this application. The residents feel the concerns have not been addressed to date, and that the timing of this attempt to address is another reason why residents have prepared without prejudice planning conditions, as we believe the applicant has no intention to address matters nor comply with the draft conditions set out in the DM report. All residents have a right to... Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nolene. Um, okay. And Mr. John Skelly to make representation as the agent in support of the application. Um, John, you're via Zoom. Okay, and again, you have three minutes, and once the three minutes is over, um, you'll be cut off. Okay, so over to yourself, John. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, thanks to the committee for the opportunity to speak in support of the application. Um, I want to touch on three determinative factors for this application. One, the development plan zoning. Two, any other material planning considerations. And three, the economic benefits of the scheme. The proposals are consistent with the site's location within the development limits of Lurgan and within the long-established Ansborough Industrial Estate, a 36-hectare industrial estate 
for which this application only involves 3.5 hectares. The application is for a food storage and distribution facility and industrial use in total compliance with the land use zoning within the Craig Avenue area plan. The policy states that it is in the national and local interest that adequate sites are retained for industrial and mixed business use and their location are, locations are essential to the economic prosperity of the town. Accordingly, the council identifies areas of existing industrial land within the Craig Avenue area, urban area, which should be retained for economic, infrastructural and access reasons, and this includes the application site. Policy PED1 of PPS4 relates to economic development proposals within settlements. It states specifically with regard to storage and distribution uses, the proposals for such uses will generally only be permitted if specifically zoned for that use or within an existing industrial, industrial or employment area. This means that proposals for this type of economic development can only be accommodated in existing or zoned land. Therefore, the council need to support and encourage proposals of this nature in this location. There is, a legitimate, there is a legitimate expectation that proposals of this nature will be approved in this zone location. With regard to other material planning considerations, we appreciate the concerns of residents, which predominantly relate to noise and traffic concerns. This application has been in the planning system since August 2020, over three years. The proposals have been subject to robust analysis and scrutiny by both the planning officers and statutory consultees throughout the process. In response, significant detail has been submitted with the application to ensure that without doubt, the proposals have complied with all the criteria. As such, a recommendation for approval has been re reached confirming that the council planners and all statutory consultees are content that the proposals present no risk to ve vehicle or pedestrian safety, no risk to residential amenities and no risk to the environment. The economic benefits of this scheme also need to be weighed in favour. They represent an investment of between eight and 10 million pounds there will be considerable job creation during the construction and operation, and it will also help bolster the existing future uses within this employment zoning. We will reiterate to the committee that this site is zoned for the proposed use, and the site is considered the most appropriate location for this type of economic development. Planning restrictions mean that it will be difficult for such proposals to be approved outside these zonings. Sustainable development should be permitted, and proposals that accord with the updated development plan should be approved unless material considerations uh, state otherwise. Following three years of providing technical and evidence-based analysis of the scheme, no material considerations uh, have been identified that would warrant the refusal of those applications. To the contrary, they are compelling. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Yeah, members, don't forget we have um, in, in attendance, we have uh, the via Zoom, James Shaw from Hepworth Consultants, Luke Jones from Mode Transport, and John Leverty from Light Con Consultant. Um, also, we have road service and environmental health. Okay, so floor is open for yourselves, members, to ask questions. Okay. <clears throat> Councillor Duffy, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thanks to all the speakers, sir. It says here in this, to support the proposed development, the application is accompanied by the following a pre-application community consul consultation report. Could somebody enlighten me as to what that said or what was done? Because apparently the community is not behind this a bit. I'm going to bring in Sinead. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Yeah, minimum. Um, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. A uh, minimum requirement, I have to go through what exactly was taken, but the, the neighbours of the nearby residents had to get a leaflet drop of it, and then a, 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 an event was held online as well. So but they had an, an application to submit their comments before the application came in uh, to us, and then take it on board, but they have to submit the, uh, the comments to the, um, the planning agent. I do think the planning agent has changed. Since the pre since the, the previous ones that may not have been John Skelly, but I've need to go through exactly what exactly was done at that time. If you want me to go through the, the portal here just to see, but it's basically a community consultation undertaken with the, the community prior to coming in with us. Yeah, please. And I would like to know uh, why it says to support the proposed development of the community consultation, you know, if their replies are against it. It knows, yeah. 
just that is just awarding to support the application, not that the application is supported in any way. That's just to support the application, as in um, the reports to support it to support their recommendation, but not that the fact that it's been supported by the community. That doesn't mean that. So we would just always use that language in any of reports to support their application has been included with. So what the agent has to put in to support his application, not that it has been supported by the community. That doesn't that doesn't mean that in the report. Thank you. And another question, in another part, it says a noise report of a location representative of the nearest dwelling. So that, was that not actually carried at the nearest dwelling? It says in another part, there's a noise report at a location representative of the nearest dwelling. Yeah, the, there is just beside the location of the dwelling, basically where it is. You can, Nell Curry has the you know, exact measurements of where they were taken, but it's in the noise impact assessment where exactly those particular noise impact assessments were carried out. Yeah, but was it carried out at one of the residents' dwellings, the nearest? Because it says representative, which doesn't exactly say it was carried out at such and such a house. Want me to bring in Nell to to help us out here now? Can you come in there? Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the noise consultant has taken um, a background noise level, which would be representative of the noise level at the nearest receptor. Uh, the noise consultant hasn't taken it within the property of the nearest receptor, but adjacent to, which would be representative of the background level. I would actually like to hear from the residents, you know, have they any views on that? Okay, I'm going to bring in, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, I need one person to speak, please, if somebody's on the microphone, because I can't hear. There's a bit, it's like a big echo through here. Thank you. Just want to know the exact location of that. Now, can you give us a location of where exactly you, you that held should, that, please? That should be within within the noise report. Yeah. Just for a Um, it's described within 3.1 of the noise um, environmental noise survey. It states that environmental noise levels were measured on site for a period of 24 hours at a location towards the south east corner of the site, uh, which was considered to be representative of the nearest residential property to propose development. And the measurement location is shown in figure one and is marked as figure one. So it's within the noise report detailed in figure one. And that's at the rear, it's at the rear in the appendices. Thank you very much. Any more questions or Councillor Duffy? Want to come back? No problem. Okay. Yeah, uh, question for Nolan. Nolan, you sort of going to bring in road service here. Um, you'd mentioned that the application, I believe, or the survey that road service had carried out was predates the application. Is that right? Um, I'm not sure what policy you were quoting. Um, 
so you said PED, I'm not too sure, but you mentioned about traffic policy. Um, I was just wondering, could you elaborate on that again? And then obviously for road service to um to clarify their position on it. Res residents actually at the end for road also just took pen and paper and watched the amount of traffic going past. And it actually there was more traffic and HGVs going that we recorded than that was were recorded by the got the agencies. So it just seems because there's conflict and what's what we record and what they record and also the time of the day that things were recorded at. You know, because you know yourself, you could record something at say six in the morning, you'll you'll get very zero traffic. Same with noise. You could record from NASA, you'll probably hear nothing. Um, but if you have so many traffic or cars going by, say at three or four o'clock and five o'clock, when Nance Road is chocolate block, when it's bumper to bumper, you'll get a very different readout. Or when the the um boats or all the trucks coming off the boats, you see again there's a timing roughly with the, by the time the trucks go off the boats and dance for road, there's a correlation between that as well. So based on we did our own we survey, which is which is fine enough. There's nothing wrong with there's just a pen and paper and tally system. We had more trucks going past than what they were recording. And the policy that you you quoted sorry the policy that you'd quoted regarding sort of the the policy yeah, um, of the traffic pre predated the application. Is that right? Yes. Yes. What policy was that? Can you can you remember? We need to check because we've been doing this. Like, I'm, can I be really honest? We're just residents trying yeah. to work our way through systems and policies, and this has been thirty months. This is not our area. If you yeah. come into say, I'll say a hospital situation, I will look after you in a hospital situation. This is not my area, and we're trying our best to stop something that we find. I've been really honest with you. There's a lot of discrepancies. I'll be honest, there's a lot of lies, and we're only trying our way to trumble through a system and a portal that does not help your average citizen in this community. No so, do yeah, no, I appreciate that. Okay, so road service, if you can remember, there was a policy <coughs> that was quoted regarding that predated sort of this application um, it links in with sort of what, what's happening on the ground can you sort of elaborate and give us your perspective as well as sort of comment on your data that was collected thank you chair in response um i would probably um i'll probably start by saying that we reviewed the the traffic and the repercussions of this development early on when it was when it was first put forward. However, following uh, objections uh, received and some confusion about the number of developments and illegal developments at this site, we actually undertook, uh, we asked for our figures to be reconsidered. We've undertook uh, a secondary survey. Uh, we've sought to clarify which development how many lorries were using the site, uh, how many developers were using the site. And following that, we've gone back out and we've done our own surveys. And the, those surveys have been done in September 23. So they're, they're relatively new surveys. Uh, we've gone out to assess if the traffic levels uh, were in line with the traffic assessments as provided by, by the, the, the developer. Now, we've gone out unannounced. We've taken peak times. Now, when I say peak times, I'm talking 7 o'clock till 10 o'clock in the morning when we expect traffic to be at its heaviest, including um, uh, school traffic. Uh, we held off until the schools had gone back to make sure that we captured um, any residential school traffic uh, in the numbers that we were looking at. And then we, we then assessed it using, I suppose, the best figures that we could. Um, when we assess the, um, the suitability of a road, we've got to look at a percentage increase that a development will bring uh, to a road. So we've used the lowest figures. Now, what I mean by that is, if we take a traffic count on that road, um, we're looking at a percentage increase. Now, if we take the highest figures that we've got, that percentage increase will be lower. So we've taken historical data to give us, to give this uh, sort of precautionary and the worst case scenario. 
We've then added the figures on that were in the transport assessment and the ones that we've actually looked at ourselves, and it still falls within the 5%. And that's why we have, we believe that this is satisfactory for the conditions and the infrastructure that's in place. Okay, thank you very much. Do you want to come back, Andy? Greg, yeah. I appreciate the level of, of objection here. And because the level of objection was so high, I wanted to satisfy myself. So I actually went out to, in the mornings and sort of helped to take those figures because I wanted to be sure that the figures that were, put, that were being put forward. I just want to add in that those... Those site visits were unannounced. We didn't let anybody know where we were going, and we did try and make sure that that was peak times. So we have four dates here where we actually went out, but for all of those four dates were the latter part of this year. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, members, any other questions? more questions members going to move on to debate any any concerns or que queries councillor duffy yes thank you chair and it just goes to show you sort of industry and public housing don't really mix you know as such you know this is just really a prime example I am strongly leaning towards a site visit because I don't really know the area. I know that traffic lights at the end of the Ansborough Road, you know, been around there, that's about it. So as to the location where this is proposed, the alleged illegal developments that's on site and all already, I would like to go out and see what's there and, you know, and the location to properties. So... When it comes to proposals, I will probably be making that proposal. Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor Duffy. I suppose there's, there was a lot of information there. And I suppose from my own perspective, I'd like to see sort of where, where the, um, the data was taken from as well. Okay, members, any other sort of comments? No. Okay, I'm going to push this on now to uh, make a decision. Can I get a proposal? Councillor Duffy. I would propose we'll go for a site visit on this application, Chair. Sure. Thank you very much. Councillor Duffy and Councillor Donnelly, please. And then, go ahead, Councillor, Councillor Donnelly, go ahead. I'd like to second Councillor Duffy's proposal. Okay, thank you very much, members. We have a proposal by Councillor Duffy that we go for a site visit and second by Councillor Donnelly, are we all agreed? Great. Okay, thank you very much, members, and thank you very much to our visitors and to our visitors online. Yeah, can I ask?
please turn on the live feed. Thank you very much. Yeah, moving on to Appendix 6, application number LA08-2022, 0941F, Anderson Approval in the Cornerstone. And we're going to bring in Liam McCrum, Senior Planning Officer, to present the report on PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, Liam, just find it here. There you go, Liam. Thank you, Chair. This application seeks full planning permission for the removal of an existing 17.9 metre telecommunications mast and replacing 5 metres north with a 22.5 metre tower, including six number antenna and associate ancillary works and associate head frame. The application is before you this evening because of the number of objections received. The application site is located within the town centre boundary of Bambridge and is within the grounds of Bambridge Telephone Exchange. The site is located within a mixed use area with businesses, ecclesiastical, residential and educational in the vicinity. To date, 10 objections from seven different postal addresses have been received in relation to this proposal. The main points of objections and officers' consideration of these have been detailed in the report circulated. However, the main concerns raised relate to visual impact and impacts on health. As detailed in the report, the nearest residential properties to the application site are at 56 Scarva Street, approximately 40 metres east, numbers 13 and 14 Scarva Walk, approximately 68 metres north, and the residential care home at Crozier House, 76 metres south of the site. In terms of the health impacts, the proposal was accompanied by an ICNIRP declaration of conformity. Regional guidance advises that where applications for development of telecommunications equipment are accompanied by this declaration, it should not be necessary for the planning authority to consider health concerns any further. In terms of the siting and design, DCAN 14 suggests that areas that already have engineered forms and structures will often be the best opportunity for siting of such equipment. In this instance, the proposed 22 metre high telecoms tower and its antenna will be replacing an existing telecoms tower at 17.9 metres. The new mast will be 4.6 metres higher than the existing, albeit 5 metres away. In this case, officers are of the opinion that the proposed mast will not have a significantly greater visual impact than the existing, and the design of the mast is appropriate to the character of the area. Officers are content that the proposal to erect the 22.5 metre high telecoms mast will not result in any unacceptable adverse impact on visual immunity. Officers of the opinion that the proposal meets with the policy requirements of TEL1 and the corresponding sections of the SPPS and recommend that members grant planning permission subject to the conditions suggested in the report. If we just want to go through the PowerPoint. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So you can see our application site within the general area, just off the Scarborough Road, Bambridge. This is our site location plan with the site outlined in red. This is the existing site plan. And if you can just make out the footprints of the existing mast. Next slide, please. This is the proposed site plan. And you can see the five meter difference as to where the proposed mast is to go. That's the uh, elevation of the existing site location or the existing mast. And that's the elevation of the proposed mass with the 4.6 meter height increase. Just an aerial uh, of the site. You can see the context within the Eurospar and uh, the local properties and Crozier House and uh, the local church beside. Next slide, please. This is a view of the mast. You can see it in the foreground from Scarver Road. And another view just in front of the mast from Scarver Street. <laughs> and this is one of just behind the area of open space at the junction of Eden Derry Road and the Scarver Road looking across the car park. And you can just see in the foreground the existing mast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liam. And members, we have in attendance, we have Mr. Patrick Mira to make representation objection to the application. Very much welcome, uh, Mr. Mira. Um, we have had Natalie Rogers who had asked for speaking rights after the deadline, but has been refused. And we have Liz Ross here to make representation as the agent. Okay, so 
Mr. Mayor, I'm going to bring yourself in. Okay, you have three minutes. And once three minutes is up, I'll be <laughs> cutting you off, okay? So you're very welcome. I'm just trying to find you here. Okay, that's you there. So whenever, whenever you're ready, just crack on, okay? I present here today to object to this plan application. I do so for many reasons. The mast will be highly visible due to the proposed increase from 17.9 metres to 22.5 and will have a negative impact in the area. It's located next to businesses, shops, elderly care homes and schools. Uh, there has been virtually no consultation with the local schools, libraries, elderly care homes, all in close proximity to the proposed mast. I contacted St Mary's Primary School, Bambridge Nursery, Crozier House, the Bambridge Library, all stated very vociferously that they had received nothing at all in relation to this and were very worried about it, a lot of them. Uh, I also object to the, uh, the children of local schools and vulnerable elderly being subjected to vast amounts of radiation, EMF radiation, it is known that radiation exposure levels within 500 metres of one of these installations increases the risk of neurological symptoms, headaches, loss of memory and learning capabilities, especially in children. St Mary's, uh, it's located 321 metres away. Uh, in a town where full fibre broadband connections are becoming freely available, why is this technology not being prioritised as fibre does not leak uh, radio frequency radiation. It's more stable. It's less vulnerable to hacking and longer lasting. The public seem to think that 5G is really going to get them a better signal of broadband. It doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, 5G seems to be more for connection to the Internet of Things. Uh, there are multiple trees located next to and adjacent to the pros direction, has the council consulted their tree officer in relation to the potential impact on these trees? All the cabinets uh, for these installations seem to carry warnings about high voltage and or high radio frequencies. How can these possibly safe for children and elderly, you know, vulnerable people uh, if you know, these carry these warnings. I'd just like to also add that, um, you know, I did receive an email saying basically uh, not to talk about anything off planning, but in sentence one, section 185 of the MPPF and 2018 ECC code, all in relation to planning, these both clearly state that public health is an imperative and competent a totally imperative in relation to the authorities should be, you know, looking into these health risks with greater detail. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, well done, well done. And um, over to yourself, um, Mr. Ross, I'm going to bring yourself in to make a representation as the agent in support, okay? You've already been up in the hot seat, so you know what the, the score is. Okay, over to yourself. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again, Chairman, and uh, hello again, uh, members. Um, so uh, uh, as Liam has just said, um, there's been a mast on this site. It's an established mast on this site. It's been there for many years. And in our terms, it's a perfect site um, because it's in the established um, exchange site. It's in an urban area. And at this particular location, it can serve a large part of Band Bridge, including the town centre. So although all masts are important, in Band Bridge terms, this is probably the most important mast because it's centrally locate, located. Uh, it's just worth noting, members, that although the mast is for O2 and Vodafone equipment, that actually incorporates many other providers. For example, this mast uh, uh, incorporates GIFGAF, Sky Mobile, Virgin Mobile, Tesco Mobile, Voxy, Asda Mobile, Libra Mobile and Talk Mobile. So there's lots of different carriers. The mass needs to be improved to provide an adequate level of coverage for Banbridge. And I've said earlier, we're using our phones more often. We're using them for more services. So the network needs to come up, keep up with demand. 
If this mast isn't replaced, people will notice the coverage becoming steadily worse in Banbridge, especially at peak times. Uh, the company is making a significant investment in Banbridge to keep the coverage levels good in the town. Uh, nearly all the modern masts that we're dealing with and we're seeing coming forward from the operators these days, members, are at least 20 metres high, usually 25 metres um, and, and a lot of sites. And I'm just going to tell you about the reasons for that. Firstly, the shorter wavelengths associated with 4G and eventually 5G need to be set up at a higher level to get the signal out because those signals are susceptible to interference from buildings and trees uh, and more so than would have been the case for uh, 3G and 2G before. So it's necessary to make sure you clear the obstacles and get that signal out. Um, and obviously the other thing is that a higher mast allows more shared services on one single site. So in summary, Members, it's an established site around which the local telecoms network has been based, has been mapped out beyond this. It's essential to improve coverage for the local community. So I respectfully ask you to endorse the officer's recommendation and approve the application. Thank you, members. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Councillor Ryan, you're muted. Thank you very much, Mr. Ross, and thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, for your representations. Yes, members, I'm going to open the floor. Any questions? <coughs> Councillor Duffy, please. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the speakers. Just sort of on the same basis as the first one, our communications firm just don't seem to have much communication with local people, consultation in round know these masks and was there no communication no contact with any of the bodies you know the residential home the schools or anything before this was considered thank you for the question councillor thank you chair um the, yes I, again councillor um there's a communications team and and within the company, as we're all communications teams within the companies, but yes, and they had written to all the local councillors in that area and actually all the MLAs as well prior to the application being submitted. Uh, we also wrote to St Mary's Primary School and to Banbridge Nursery School before the planning application and no responses were received. Um, I, I, I maybe just note to the to the, the committee that telecoms were, like, were not obliged to, you know, and planning applicants generally aren't obliged to go out and communicate pre-application, but we, we do that. Uh, all of the telecoms applications, we do go through a pre-application consultation process with local representatives and lo local schools beforehand. Happy enough, Councillor Duffy. Answers your question anyway. Okay. Members, any other questions? Councillor O'Dowd, please. Thank you, Chair. I would just like to ask this gentleman here what he would you would you think of the answer that was given now? Uh, I, I actually don't know. No, one second. Hang on, hang on to get here. <laughs> right on there. Go ahead. I Patrick. actually contacted St Mary's School. Uh, I contacted a uh, Crozier House. I contacted uh, that Bambridge Nursery School as well. Bambridge Nursery actually said that they don't know how possibly their name could be on this application because they did object to some other application, but it was. Definitely nothing in relation to this one. So I don't know whether that's possibly been copied and pasted from an old application. But St Mary's, which is a primary school, it's only yeah, it's only three hundred and twenty-one meters. Absolutely no idea whatsoever. Uh, the Crozier House again. They stated they had no 
notion whatsoever. So look, it's it's not a case of you know me just trying it all. There's been no consultation with the people. You know, there's so many schools in the area. Uh, there's places of worship. Uh, you know, I think it's just vital that this is actually looked in and properly consulted with these these schools. You know, and the parents. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you, Councillor Dowd. Any members, any other questions? No questions. Okay, so we'll move on to debate. Okay, I'm looking for your views, members. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to seek for a decision. Okay, can I give a proposal? Councillor Lavery, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to the, the present all the presenters there um, for contributing. Has been listening in carefully. This is now the third one we've had in the past, maybe two months or so. Um, so we're sort of getting up to speed with the kind of things we can consider, especially with regards to any of those health concerns, so long as we meet the. The certificate outlined by the International Commission for Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. We have to have to take that as, as read. In terms of the location itself, you no know, fact that there's already a mast on site, I think gives considerable weight to the approval. And that although it's slightly higher by an additional couple of meters, that the site being already in use and that um sort of in a highly residential zone. Um Certainly, in my view, sort of makes the approval recommendation seem appropriate. Um, so I'll be inclined to propose the recommendation to approve regarding this application. Thank you. And Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, it's supposed to follow on from Councillor Lavery's comments. I would be in broad agreement with them and happy to second it in the circumstances. Okay, members, we have a proposal to accept the, the recommendation by the officers. Uh, proposed by Council Lobby, second by Alderman Wilson, and we all agreed. Okay, agreed. Thank you very much, members. Okay, thank you. Okay, move on to Appendix 5, application number LS08 2022 13950, and it's an approval for Mr. Gregory <coughs> Barry. We're going to bring in Trudy Chapman, the Senior Planning Officer, to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> you go, Trudy, go ahead. Thank you. This application seeks outline uh, permission for two dwellings, and it's before you this evening as four objections have been received. The application site is located in the rural area as defined in the Armagh Area Plan 2004, approximately three kilometres west of Armagh City. The site is currently an agricultural field. To the north of the site lies number 116 and to the site lies numbers 114 and 112. These three dwellings and their associated outbuildings are considered to meet the definition of a substantially and continuously built up frontage as set out in policy CTY8. Officers of the opinion that two sensitively designed dwellings in this site would not be out of character with the development pattern along this section of frontage of Navenfort Road in terms of size, scale, siding and plot size and would integrate into the landscape in accordance with policy CTY 13 and 14 and that the majority of the boundaries can be retained with the exception of that required to be removed to provide a safe access. The site is located in an area of high archaeological potential. However, HED have advised that they are content with the principle of development subject to conditions for the agreement and the implementation of a developer-funded developer programme of archaeological works. This is to identify and record any remains in advance of new construction or to provide for the preservation in situ, which complies with policy BH4 of PPS6. The application seeks outline permission and is therefore only to establish the principle of two dwellings on the site. Officers, however, are of the opinion that with the ridge height restriction of six metres, two dwellings could be provided on this site, which would not unduly impact on the residential amenity of any of the neighbouring properties. Notwithstanding this, residential amenity would be considered further at a reserve matter stage. 
Officers in consult consultation with DFI roads are content that a safe access can be achieved in accordance with PPS 3. And members are advised that during the process of an application, four objections were received. The main points raised and officers' consideration of these have been detailed in the report circulated. However, they can be summarised as contrary to policy, out of character, impact on wildlife through the loss of trees, road safety and impact on archaeology and heritage. Members are advised that all consultation responses were favourable and that officers are of the opinion that the proposal meets all relevant planning policies and recommend that permission be granted subject to the conditions set out in the report. And I'll just take you through the slides. Thank you. So that's a, a location in the general area, as I say, about three kilometres to the west of Armagh. So our site location plan, now the site location plan, the map is slightly out of date. So the two houses to the bottom have since been replaced by two larger houses. And you'll see in the report that was circulated, you actually got an aerial photograph at the back to show that difference. Next one, please. So this is an aerial photograph of the site within the wider area. Um, you'll see this the circular feature to the to the right. Um, that's not in Ford itself. So we are quite close to it. Next slide, please. And that's um a close up. So you'll see the two two little houses to the south of the site have been replaced, as I say, by two detached properties. Next slide, please. So this is showing number one one two Nottingham Fort Road. This is um the furthest of the three dwellings in the uh, frontage that we're looking at. And the next slide, please. So this one shows 112 and 114, and just in between the trees, you can see the roof of 116. And the next slide, please. So this is taken from within the site, and we're looking southeast back towards number 114. And the next slide, please, is from the same point looking north, and that shows you the, the gable end then and the garage of number 116. Next slide, please. So these are taken from the front of number 115, which is a single story dwelling opposite the site and shows you the, the mature frontage along the road. Um, next slide, please. And this is then taken from the field entrance um, to the site, uh, looking across the site. So you can see number 116 to the right of that picture and number 114 to the left of it. And the next slide, please. And this is then taken from slightly further up. Um, outside number 116, looking back down, now that's a Google Street View image. And right in the middle, you can see um, blue tarpaulin, I think it is, that was over the roof of number 114 while it was being constructed. Just gives you an indication of the, the distance between them. This is our, oh, sorry, that's our site con yeah. concepts sent in by the agent. Um, so it essentially shows the site will be divided in two to provide the two uh, dwellings. And then the next one is our location of objectors. Now you have three noted there. Um, a fourth one was uh, submitted, but it was submitted by email, so we don't have a postal address for that person. And that should be us. No, sorry, one last heritage map. So that um, shows all the heritage in the area to show it that it is an uh, area of significant archaeological interest. But as I say, HED have no objections to the proposal subject to conditions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Trudy. Okay, members, with no other guest speakers this evening, so any questions? No? Okay. Alderman Kennedy? I, it's a pretty backward location, Trudy, isn't it? It's, uh, it's in off the beaten track quite a wee bit, isn't it? It is a very narrow road, but um, it is off the main, would be the Killyleigh Road, takes you out towards that way, which you just pass the, the entrance to the Navin Centre, you're just a wee bit further up on that, so you're not too far off the main road. No. Thank you very much, Trudy. Okay, members, no other questions? Can we move on to debate? Can you, can you express your views? Councillor Donnelly. This is, say, the, the Nelvin Fort, the historical site of the Nelvin Fort. Is it very close to it? Thank you. Um, Paula, would you mind going back to slide four, please?
So that image there, the, the arrow is a, an approximate location of the site. And then the, the ringed feature is Navenfort itself. So it, it's probably within a, about a mile or so of, of the actual fort. And it is in the uh, boundary of the area of significant archaeological interest. And that's why we have consulted with the HED and they've said they have no objections to it. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Trillian. Trillian, the report says subject to conditions. What are the conditions, if you don't mind? If you can remember. Okay. Let's get the correct wording for you. So um, proposed condition number 14 requires that a program of archaeological work would be submitted and that would be done and approved in writing with ourselves in conjunction with the Department of Communities. Now, they've actually speci specified that that should include the identification and evaluation of any archaeological remains within the site, any mitigation of impacts of development through license ex excavation, recording and preservation of remains in situ, post-excavation analysis, sufficient to prepare an archaeological report to publication standard and preparation of a digital documentary and material archive for deposition. Um, no works can take place until that has been carried out. Um, and then they also have required in condition uh, 16, a program of post excavation analysis and the preparation of an archaeological report. So it's it's a, a level beyond what we'd normally expect on an application. So, um, but they have, they have said that they have no objections with it. And because we've had quite a lot of development on the Lambert Road in recent years, that there is potential for stuff to be found, but there's no guarantee. So it, it's basically a precautionary approach. No problem. Thank you very much, Trudy. I'm going to bring in an Alderman Kennedy. Thank you, Chair. I would think that there's plenty of restrictions on it there. Like it's going to be well monitored and they, there's a height restriction on the floor level restriction, so they're not going to be big massive monstrosities within the area. So I think I'm happy enough. Thank you very much, Alderman. Yep. Any other comments or questions? Okay, we're going to move on for a decision. Okay, members. Alderman Kennedy, please. I'm happy enough to propose, accept the officer's recommendation. Thank you very much. And Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, I'm content to second that proposal. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members, you've had a proposal by Alderman Kennedy that we accept the re uh, officer's recommendation and seconded by Alderman Wilson. Well agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much, members. Move on to Appendix 8, Application Number LA08 2022 0776F, and it's an approval uh, with. JMG Developments, Northern Ireland Limited, and Mr. Kyle Elder, there you are, um, is going to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, over to yourself, Kyle. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just before I make the presentation, I would just like to make a correction in the report. Uh, so the report refers to uh, eight objection letters from seven postal addresses. That should be that there were nine objection letters from seven postal addresses. So the application seeks full plan permission for the erection of 14 dwellings with detached garages. The proposal represents an amendment to 14 of the dwellings approved under planning application N2007 0141F. The application is before you this evening as nine third party objections have been received from seven postal addresses. Officers have taken that members have read the report in full and the addendum and as such this is a synopsis only. The site is located within the development limit of Lurgan, the land zoned as Phase 1 housing. Housing zoning LH11, land to the rear of Wood Lane, as defined by Map 5 of the Craigavon Area Plan. The proposed development is considered to comply with the key site requirements of zoning LH11, and officers do not, or officers raise no conflict between the proposed development and the Craigavon Area Plan or the SPPS. Therefore, the proposal to develop the site for residential purposes is considered acceptable in principle. Previously, full plan permission was granted on the wider site for the erection of 33 dwellings under application N2007 0141F. 14 dwellings were approved on the site of this plan and application. So plan approval N2007 0141F has lawfully commenced and therefore represents a valid fallback position. As detailed in the report, in my up the relative 
environmental impacts of the proposal against the fallback position is considered that the proposal would have no more detrimental effect on the environment than the fallback position and would offer a limited degree of betterment. Members should face that at present development is being carried out on the wider site. Regarding the proposed design layout and amenity, officers raise no concerns for the reasons detailed in the report. The proposed density is considered accept to be acceptable for this area. While the layout proposed is not in accordance with the Creating Places document, the layout is considered to be no more detrimental than the fallback position and the orientation of the dwellings on proposed sites 21 to 23 is considered to be betterment. Having applied weight to the fallback position, members are advised that in this instance, officers have raised no concerns regarding the policy provisions of PPS 7, the addendum to PPS 7, PPS 12 are creating places. The scale and mass of the dwellings are broadly in keeping with those which were previously approved on the site. The open space provision and landscaping arrangements are deemed appropriate and have been conditioned in the in the report. Mm -hmm. Members are also advised that buffer planting is proposed along the site boundaries, which will help protect the amenity of, of neighbouring properties. Vehicular access to proposed development will be provided from an access located off Cherryfield Park as approved under application N 2007-0141F. The access is being let out and is currently in loose stone. Two in Kirtledge parking spaces are proposed for each dwell and the nine communal on street visitor parking spaces are proposed. The development has a shortfall of one space from that required under parking standards. However, this is not considered in itself to be a reason to refuse planning a uh, permission in the context of the overall plan and merits of the proposal. Mm -hmm. Officers can confirm that the car parking spaces and visitor parking spaces are evenly distributed throughout the development and DFA roads have raised no objections to the parking arrangements. Officers in this instance are content that the proposal to file in accords with the SPPS and policies AMP2 and AMP7 of PPS3. The proposal is accompanied by a drainage assessment and a biodiversity checklist. These have been appraised by officers in consultation with the relevant competent authorities who have raised no objections. Members are advised that all letters of objection have been considered in the assessment of this plan application. So overall, officers consider the proposal to comply with the local development plan, the policy requirements of the SPPS and all other relevant planning policies. And on that basis, approval is recommended for the reasons outlined in the report and subject to the conditions suggested in the report and the addendum. I'll just take you through the uh, pre presentation now. Okay, so the site is located in Lurgan, just uh, southeast of the, the town centre. Next slide then just shows the site location plan with our site uh, outlined in red. The next slide is an aerial overview of the site. So this you'll see in the photographs that this is an older image with a uh, development having been currently under development on the on the wider site. Okay, the next slide then just shows the Craigavon area plan. So you can see our site uh, highlighted by the red arrow. So it's part of a larger housing zone. Uh, the next slide then shows the, the site layout for the, the 14 dwellings. And then the next slide then just shows uh, some of the sample house types that are proposed within the development, followed by another slide with the, the final house type for site 24. Next slide then uh, just shows the sections through the site to show the relationship uh, between the, some of the proposed dwellings and uh, the existing dwellings in Cherryfield Park. And then further uh, sections are then just shown on the next slide. The next slide then uh, it shows the um, the site layout of the of the fallback uh, application. So it's obviously the entire a uh, site that was dealt with there. But I've just highlighted in red uh, the the part of the site which relates to this uh, planning application. The next slide then just shows some of the house types that were approved uh, in that area of red from the previous a. Uh, slide. So this is the uh, first photograph which shows access to the site. So uh, this is from Cherryfield Park. You can see the existing dwelling Cherryfield Park there uh, in white and the red brick dwellings are a uh, some of the development which is currently underway on the on the wider site. The next slide then is just a few of the site a uh, facing facing northwest towards Cherryfield Park. So you can see the access road has been let out and new stone at present. 
Next slide then, again, it's just facing south and you can see that the boundary treatments that exist between the application site and Cherryfield Park. Next slide then, it faces towards the north of the site and you can just see that uh, some of the dwellings in Woodford Park uh, and neighbor, a neighbouring development. The next slide then faces towards the northwest corner of the site. Uh, you can just see to the right of the uh, lighting column uh, the tree. So that tree has been conditioned to be retained on the site. The next slide then is just a just really show some of the existing houses under development on the wider site. And then the final slide uh, is just taken from the junction uh, between Cherryfield Park and Rosewood Park. And you can just see uh, just in behind uh, those dwellings then the existing development on the site. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kyle. Okay, members, always open for questions. I'm going to bring in Cashel O'Dowd, please. I know you don't like me in here tonight because <laughs> I keep asking too many questions. <clears throat> An issue I have had with constituents is traffic coming measures in the States, you know, in new developments. What traffic coming measures? is going to be in here, in this area. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, so within this application, no traffic camera measures are proposed. So basically, this application is slightly different in that it has a fallback position and the roadway was actually approved under the 2007 application. So because there is a fallback position for 14 dwellings, we can't, we can't, and they're relying on the previously approved road. Uh, there's no PSD drawings within this application. We can't insist on any traffic coming within, within this development based on the, on the fallback. Yeah, thank you very much, Kate, um, for, for that clarification. Councillor Duffy, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, open space scale, is this one of these sites where applied for a small number of houses so they don't have to leave open space behind and then get them built and then apply for an off you and then an off you? Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor, for your question uh, through the chair. Um, yeah, so th this this uh, phase of the development would actually finish out that entire uh, zoning. So there is a, a small area of open space proposed within this application, but this was the only area of open space effectively proposed within the entire 2007 application. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, there's no loss of open space. Within the 2007 application, the access to the first dwelling that would be part of our site was actually came through the middle of the open space. So it severed open space. So if you had kids playing in that, you potentially would have had you know, traffic going through that to, to a residential property, which obviously isn't ideal. So they have actually revised that so that there's no access through the open space. It's one area of open space, albeit it is a small area, but it is in keeping with the 2007 permission. I would consider that it is a betterment to the 2007 permission, but albeit it is small, but based on that fallback again, we couldn't, we couldn't insist on a larger area to be provided. Yeah, thank you very much, Kev. Hey, members, any other questions? Okay, going to move on to comments, your views. Yep. Okay, members, may I seek a proposal of sorts? <coughs> Councillor Duffy and then Alderman Wilson. I'll propose the officer's recommendation. Thank you very much, Councillor Duffy and Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, I'm content to second that proposal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, members, you have a proposal to support the recommendation and second by Alderman Wilson, or proposed by Councillor Duffy, second by Alderman Wilson. 
We all agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much, members. Move on to appendix nine, application number LA08 2023 2728F. Approval. Oh, it's Melvin Mutri. Councillor Mutri has made a declaration. Um, he's online and going to bring him in. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it was just to again declare that non pecuniary interest in the following application um, due to the applicant being a close family relative. <laughs> yeah. Many thanks for that clarification. Yeah. And we have Davina Craven, who's the planning officer, to present the report and PowerPoint presentation. Over to yourself. Take yourself off. Thank you, Chair. This application is before members this evening as the head of planning considers the proposal merits consideration by the planning committee. Officers have taken that members have read the report and as such, this is a synopsis only. The site is located within the development limit of Lurgan as set out in the Craigavon Area Plan 2010. The site has been an established retail premises since the grant of plan permission in the 1970s, with this application seeking permission primarily to make physical alterations to the external of the external exterior of the building and the forecourt. The alterations consist of a new centre of front entrance finished in contemporary stone, the closure of the corner entrance on the ground floor and the removal of two square windows at first floor level, a new gallery style window opening onto the forecourt with a new central door and the closure of the existing forecourt doorway, along with new bollards across the frontage to delineate the pedestrian paths, new concrete finish along the forecourt and footpaths and all existing parking spaces to be renewed. The application has been advertised and never notified in accordance with the council's salary provisions. One letter of objection was received stating that they were unable to view the proposed plans online. However, copies of the drawings were emailed to the objector and no further representations have been received. DFI roads were consulted in relation to the proposal and offer no objection, given that no changes are proposed to the vehicular access arrangements on the site and no additional floor space is to be provided within the premises. The only physical changes would be to the exterior of the building and resurfacing of the forecourt and bollards, bollards added for pedestrian safety. <laughs> In terms of the alterations and extensions, Policy Des 2 of a planned strategy for rural Northern Ireland states that all alterations and extensions to buildings should normally respect the scale, form, detailing, detailing and materials of the original building. Officers consider the proposed works are to make an aesthetic improvement to the building, provide a central customer shop access and allow for better surveillance across the field forecourt area. The development has been designed in terms of scale and finished to complement and remain subordinate to the design and appearance of the existing building. It will also sit comfortably within the townscape without adversely impacting upon the character of the area. The site is not located within a conservation area or an area of townscape character. Officers are satisfied the proposal is compliant with the development plan, the SPPS, and plan, plan policy DES2 of a plan strategy for rural, rural Northern Ireland. And uh, um, officers have taken into consideration all material matters raised and recommend that members approve this application. And I'll just take you through the PowerPoint. That pink building is the petrol filling station and the canopy above the, the fuel court. Um, it's along, located along the main arterial, arterial route from Lurgan to Bambridge. Next slide, please. Just an earlier context of the site. So you can see the fuel canopy above the forecourt. You can see this, the shop to the south and then the, the parking. And just to the right of that is two hot food takeaways. Next slide, please. It's just site location plan is submitted. <clears throat> Um, there's no proposed real change to the site layout other than bollards across the frontage of the field court and all the parking spaces are to be relined. Next slide, please. Um, this is the existing elevation. If you look at the very, very top elevation, the door on the left, that's to be closed up um, and replaced by a more central entrance along the two-story element of the building. Next slide, file, please. Uh, slide, please. Um, this is the elevation as proposed. You can see that doorway closed up to the left and the new um, central entrance. Uh, across the right, you can see a new gallery window and a single entrance to the, the, the field forecourt. Next slide, please. That's the, the proposed floor plans. The, down, the ground floor is to be um, reorganized to, to suit the retailer. Next slide, please. Sorry, the angle of the sun caught me out on this. That's the, 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 the shop and the pedal filling station. And to the right is Wood Lane. Next slide, please. Uh, to the left there, you can see the, the hot food units adjacent to the car park, and that's that doorway in the distance that's to be closed up. Next slide, please. 
And that's just a comparison then of the, the elevation of the frontage as existing and what is proposed on the bottom on the bottom elevation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tavina. Okay, members, so to your shells, any questions? Floor's open. No, okay, move it on. Any comments? Councillor Lavery, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Davina. I know this is Davina's first time presenting the committee, I think, so I was trying to think of some difficult questions to ask her, but I was so well presented, I, I didn't have anything. It's a uh, you know, very well presented reporter, and you know the, the recommendations reasonable in my eyes. So, uh, thank you. I was, I was kind of waiting until I got to the very end before we started. This is down here is Nicola Queenie, so that's why it's kind of, where are you? I'm looking for you. <laughs> okay, any other comments? Okay, can I get a second proposal, please, members? Alderman Wilson, please. Yeah, happy to propose. We accept the recommendation. Thank you very much, Alderman. And second by Councillor Lavery. Okay, members, proposed by Alderman Wilson, we accept the Report on second by Councillor Lavery. We all agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much, members, and thank you for, to our members of staff. And welcome to our new our new gang. I suppose it's just called us now, is it? <laughs> um okay, members, we are moving into Christmas. Councillor Duffy, go ahead. One quick favour of Ruth. Will it be possible? I know there's three site meetings planned, just to have them and there's not a great deal of distance between Lurg and Bordown all on the one day. You know, if possible, it's going to be a busy day. That one, members, thank you very much for 2023 and good luck. Have a good Christmas. Go easy on the, the pays and all the good, the good stuff. And hopefully, hopefully, Santa's good to you. I know some of you will be getting a bag or two of coal. Yeah, <laughs> and let's say here it was. And thank you. Can I ask ACT to please turn off?